This is section 18 of the complete works of George Saville, first Marquis of Halifax. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Some cautions offered to the consideration of those who are to choose members to serve for the ensuing Parliament. Read by John Greenman. I will make no other introduction than that it is hoped the counties and boroughs will remember in general that besides other consequences they will have the credit of a good choice or the scandal that belongeth to an ill one the creators will be thought like their creatures and therefore an ill choice will either be a disparagement of their understanding or their morals there cannot be a fuller approbation of a thing than the choosing of it so that the fault of the members chosen if known beforehand will be judged to be of the growth of that county or borough after such a solemn approbation of them in short those who send up their representatives to westminster should take care they may be such as will do them right and their country honor now to the particulars one a very extraordinary earnestness to be chosen is no very good symptom a desire to serve the nation in parliament is an englishman's ambition always to be encouraged and never to be disapproved a man may not only be willing to stand but he may declare that willingness to his friends that they may assist him and by all the means becoming a modest and prudent man he may endeavor to succeed and prevent the being disappointed in it but there is a wide difference between this and the raising a kind of petty war in the county or corporation entering the lists rather for a combat than an election throwing fireballs to put men into heat and omitting to spread no reports whether true or false which may give an advantage by laying a blemish upon a competitor these methods will ever be suspicious it will never be thought a natural thing for men to take such extravagant pains for the mere sake of doing good to others to be content to suffer something for a good end is that which many would do without any great repugnance but where a man can honestly propose nothing to himself except troubles charge and loss by absence from his own affairs to be so violent in the pursuit of so ill a bargain is not at all suited to the languishing virtue of mankind so corrupted such a self-denying zeal in such a self-seeking age is so little to be imagined that it may without injury be suspected therefore when these blustering pretenders come upon the stage their natural temper and other circumstances ought to be very well considered before men trust them with the disposal of their money or their liberty and i am apt to believe there could hardly be found one single man whose other qualifications would overbalance the objections that lie against such importunate suitors two recommending letters ought to have no effect upon elections in this i must distinguish for though in strictness perhaps there should be no exception yet in compliance with long practice and out of an indulgence that is necessary in a time when mankind is too much loosened from severe rules to be kept close up to them letters sent only from equal men doing good men right by giving evidence in their behalf offering them as fitly qualified when they really are so and freeing them from unjust aspersions may still be allowed the letters i mean are from men of power where it may be beneficial to comply and inconvenient to oppose choice must not only be free from force but from influence which is a degree of force there must be no difficulty no apprehension that a refusal will be ill taken or resented the freeholders must be free men too they are to have no shackles upon their votes in an election and the men who stand should carry their own letters of recommendation about them 
which are their good character and behavior in the world without borrowing evidence especially when it cometh from suspected hands those who make use of these epistles ought to have no more advantage from them than the muscovites have from the letters put into their hands when they are buried to recommend them to saint nicholas the first should as little get admittance for men into the parliament as these letters can introduce the bearers into heaven the scandal of such letters liest first in the arrogant imposing of those that write them and next in the wretched meanness of those that need them men must be fallen very low in their credit who upon such an occasion have a recourse to power to support it their enemies could not give stronger evidence of their not being fit for that which they pretend to and if the electors judge otherwise they will be pretty sure in a little time to see their mistake and to repent it three non-attendance in former parliaments ought to be a bar against the choice of men who have been guilty of it it is one of the worst kinds of non-residence and the least to be excused it is very hard that men should despise a duty which perhaps is the only ground of the respect that is paid to them it is such a piece of sauciness for any one to press for the honor of serving in parliament and then to be careless in attending it that in a house where there were so many officers the penalty had not been improper to have cashiered them for not appearing at the general muster if men forbear to come out of laziness let them be gratified by taking their ease at home without interruption if out of small cunning to avoid difficulties and to escape from the inconvenience of voting in critical cases let them enjoy that despicable pitch of wisdom and never pretend to make a figure where the public is to be served if it would not be thought advisable to trust a man immediately after he hath been drawn out of a jail it may be as reasonable to look upon one who for his non-attendance in the house hath been sent for in custody as a kind of bankrupt which putteth him upon unequal terms with those who have been assiduous in the discharge of their duty they who thought fit in one session to neglect the public business may be justly suspected by their standing in the next to intend their own besides these more deliberate offenders there are some who do not attend even when they are in the house absent in their thoughts for want to comprehending the business that is doing and therefore diverted from it by anything that is trivial such men are nuisances to a serious assembly and when they are numerous it amounteth almost to a dissolution it being scarce possible for good sense to be heard whilst a noise is made by the buzzing of these horse-flies the roman censors who degraded a senator for yawning whilst there was a debate would have much more abundant matter here upon which they might exercise their jurisdiction to conclude this head there are so few that ever mended in these cases that after the first experiment it is not at all reasonable to take them upon a new trial four men who are unquiet and busy in their natures are to give more than ordinary proofs of their integrity before the electing them into a public trust can be justified as a hot summer breedeth greater swarms of flies so an active time breedeth a greater number of these shining gentlemen it is pretty sure that men who cannot allow themselves to be at rest will let nobody else be at quiet such a perpetual activity is apt by degrees to be applied to the pursuit of their private interest and their thoughts being in a continual motion they have not time to dwell long enough upon anything to entertain a scruple so that they are generally at full liberty to do what is most convenient for them without being fettered by any restraints nay further whenever it happeneth that there is an impunity for cheating these nimble gentlemen are apt to think it a disparagement to their understandings not to go into it i doubt it is not a wrong to the present age to say that a knave is a less unpopular calling 
than it hath been in former times and to say truth it would be ingratitude in some men to turn honest when they owe all they have to their knavery the people are in this respect unhappy they are too many to do their own business their numbers which make their strength are at the same time the cause of their weakness they are too unwieldy to move and for this reason nothing can ever redeem them from this incurable impotency so that they must have solicitors to pursue and look after their interests who are too often disposed to dispense with the fidelity they owe to those that trust them especially if the government will pay their bills without abatement it is better these gentlemen's dexterity should be employed anywhere than in parliament where the ill consequence of their being members is too much diffused and not restrained to the county or borough who shall be so unwary as to choose them five great drinkers are less fit to serve in parliament than is apprehended men's virtue as well as their understanding is apt to be tainted by it the appearance of it is sociable and well-natured but it is by no means to be relied upon nothing is more frail than a man too far engaged in wet popularity the habit of it maketh men careless of their business and that naturally leadeth them into circumstances that make them liable to temptation it is seldom seen that any principles have such a root as that they can be proof against the continual droppings of a bottle as to the faculties of the mind there is not less objection the vapors of wine may sometimes throw out sparks of wit but they are like scattered pieces of ore there is no vein to work upon such wit even the best of it is like paying great fines in which case there must of necessity be an abatement of the constant rent nothing sure is a greater enemy to the brain than too much moisture it can the least of any thing bear the being continually steeped and it may be said that thought may be resembled to some creatures which can live only in a dry country yet so arrogant are some men as to think they are so much masters of business as that they can play with it they imagine they can drown their reason once a day and that it shall not be the worse for it forgetting that by too often diving the understanding at last groweth too weak to rise up again i will suppose this fault was less frequent when solon made it one of his laws that it was lawful to kill a magistrate if he was found drunk such a liberty taken in this age either in the parliament or out of it would do terrible execution i cannot but mention a petition in the year sixteen forty seven from the county of devon to the house of commons against the undue election of burgesses who are strong in wine and weak in wisdom the cause of such petitions is to be prevented by choosing such as shall not give handle to them six wanting men give such cause of suspicion wherever they deal that surely the choosers will be upon their guard as often as such dangerous pretenders make their application to them let the behavior of such men be never so plausible and untainted yet they who are to pitch upon those they are to trust with all they have may be excused if they do not only consider what they are but what they may be as we pray ourselves we may not be led into temptation we ought not by any means to thrust others into it even though our own interest was not concerned and sure when it is the argument hath not less force if a man hath a small estate and a numerous family where it happeneth that a man hath as many children as he hath tenants it is not a recommending circumstance for his election when it cometh to be the question with such a man whether he shall be just to the public or cruel to his family it is very possible the decision may be on the side of corrupted nature it is a compliment to this age which it doth not deserve 
to suppose men are so tied up to morality as that they cannot be pinched out of it especially now when it is called starving not to be embroidered or served in plate the men chosen to serve their country should not be loaden with suits that may tempt them to assume privileges much less under such necessities as may more immediately prepare them for corruption men who need a parliament for their own particular interest have more reason to offer their service than others have to accept of it and though i do not doubt but there may be some whose virtue would triumph over their wants let them be never so pressing yet to expose the public to the hazard of being deceived is that which can never be justified by those that choose and though it must be allowed possible for a wanting man to be honest yet it is impossible for a man to be wise that will depend upon it seven there is a sort of men that have a tinsel wit which make them shine among those who cannot judge club and coffee-house gentlemen petty merchants of small conceits who have an empty habit of prating without meaning they always aim at wit and generally make false fire their business is less to learn than to set themselves out which makes them choose to be with such as can only be witnesses of their small ingenuity rather than with such as might improve it there is a subordinate wit as much inferior to a wit of business as a fiddler at a wake is to the lofty sound of an organ men of this size are in no degree suited to the business of redressing grievances and making laws there's a parliament wit to be distinguished from all other kinds those who have it do not stuff their heads only with cavils and objections they have a deliberate and observing wit a head turned to public things men who place a greater pleasure in mending a fault than in finding it out their understanding directeth them to object in the right place and not like those who go by no other rule than to conclude that must be the best counsel which was not taken these wholesale judges show such a gross and peevish ignorance that it appeareth so openly in all they say or do that they give loud warning to all considering men not to choose them eight the dislike of slight airy men must not go so far as to recommend heaviness in opposition to it especially where men are convicted of it by experience in former sessions as a lively coxcomb will seldom fail to lay in his claim for wit so a blockhead is apt to pretend that his heaviness is a proof of his judgment some have an universal lethargy spread upon their understanding without exception others have an insufficiency quad hoc as in some cases men have quad hunk these last can never so turn their thoughts to public business as to give the attention that is necessary to comprehend it there are those who have such a thick shell upon their brains that their ignorance is impenetrable and maketh such a stout resistance against common sense that it will never be subdued by it true heart of oak ignorance that will never yield let reason beat never so hard upon it and though their kind neighbors have at several elections sent them up to school again they have still returned the same incurable dunces there is a false gravity that is a very ill symptom and it may be said that as rivers which run very slowly have always the most mud at the bottom so a solid stiffness in the constant course of a man's life is a sign of a thick bed of mud at the bottom of his brain a dull man is so near a dead man that he is hardly to be ranked in the list of the living and as he is not to be buried whilst he is half alive so he is as little to be employed whilst he is half dead parliaments are now grown to be quite other things than they were formerly in ancient times they were little more than great assizes a roll of grievances magna charta confirmed privileges of holy church preserved 
so many sacks of wool given and away now there are traps and gins laid for the well-meaning country gentleman he is to grapple with the cunning of men in town which is not a little improved by being rewarded and encouraged so that men whose good intentions are not seconded and supported by some degree of ability are as much the more dangerous as they are less criminal than cunning knaves their honest mistakes for want of distinguishing either give a countenance to or at least lessen the scandal of the injurious things that are done to the public and with leave asked for so odd an expression their innocent guilt is as mischievous to the laws and liberties as the most deliberate malice of those that would destroy them nine there is an abuse which daily increaseth of sending such to parliament as are scarce old enough to be sent to the university i would not in this restrain the definition of these boys to the age of twenty-one if my opinion might take place i should wish that none might be chosen into the house of commons under thirty and to make some equality i should from the same motives think it convenient that no lord should have a vote in judicature under that age but to leave this digression i cannot see why the choosers should not at least make it a rule among themselves not to send any man to represent them under the age of twenty-five which is the time of majority in most other places in the world surely it is not that we are earlier plants than our neighbors such supposition could neither be justified by our climate nor by the degree of latitude in which we are placed i must therefore attribute it to the haste our ancestors had and not without reason to free themselves from the severity of wardships but whether this or anything else was the cause of our earlier stepping into man's estate so it is now that according to our laws twenty-one is the age of discretion and the young man is then vested with a legal how defective soever he may be in his natural understanding with all this there ought to be a difference made between coming out of pupilage and leaping into legislatorship it is perhaps inconvenient enough that a man should be so soon let loose to destroy his own estate but it is yet worse that he should then have a power of giving away other men's the law must make general rules to which there always will be some objections if there were triers appointed to judge when leading strings should be left off many would wear them a very great while and some perhaps with their gray hairs there being no small number of old boys in all times and especially in this it is necessary therefore to make exceptions to this general rule where the case so much requireth it as it doth in the matter in question the ground of sending these minors to parliament ought not to recommend the continuance of it to those who are lovers of liberty since it was by the authority and influence of great men that their stripling sons were first received by the humble depending boroughs or the complying counties they called it as many do still the best school for young men now experience hath showed us that it is like a school only in this respect that these youngsters when they are admitted deserve to be whipped in it if the house of commons is a school it must be for men of riper age these are too young to learn there and being elevated by a mistaken smattering in small politics they grow too supercilious to learn anywhere else so that instead of improving young promising plants they are destroyed by being misplaced if then they do themselves hurt by it it is sure yet that they do the house no good by coming into it they were not green geese that are said to have saved the capital they were certainly of full age or else their cackling could not have been heard so as to give warning indeed it looked of late when the fashion was to have long continued parliaments as if we might plant a boy in the house with a prospect that he might continue there till he had gray hairs and that the same sapling might have such a root as that he might grow up to be timber without being removed 
if these young men had skill enough to pitch upon somebody in the house to whom they might resign their opinion and upon whose judgment they might lean without reserve there might be less objection but to speak truth they know as little how to choose as those did who elected them so that there is no other expedient left than the letting them alone one may say generally speaking that a young man being too soon qualified for the serious business of parliaments would really be no good symptom it is a sign of too much phlegm and too little fire in the beginning of age if men have not a little more heat than is convenient for as they grow older they will run a hazard of not having so much as is necessary the truth is the vigor of youth is softened and misapplied when it is not spent either in war or close studies all other courses have an idle mixture that cometh to nothing and maketh them like trees which for want of pruning run up to wood and seldom or never bear any fruit to conclude this head it must be owned that there is no age of our life which doth not carry arguments along with it to humble us and therefore it would be well for the business of the world if young men would stay longer before they went into it and old men not so long before they went out of it ten next to these may be ranked a sort of superfine gentlemen carpet knights men whose heads may be said to be only appurtenances to their perukes which entirely engross all their care and application their understanding is so strictly appropriated to their dress that no part of it is upon pain of their utmost displeasure to be diverted to any other use it is not by this intended to recommend an affected clown or to make it a necessary qualification for a member of parliament that he must renounce clean linen or good manners but surely a too earnest application to make everything sit right about them striketh too deep into their small stock of thoughts to allow it furniture for anything else to do right to these fine-spun gentlemen business is too coarse a thing for them which maketh it an unreasonable hardship upon them to oppress them with it so that in tenderness to them no less than out of care to the public it is best to leave them to their tailors with whom they will live in much better correspondence when the danger is prevented of their falling out about privileges eleven men of injustice and violence in their private dealings are not to be trusted by the people with a commission to treat for them in parliament in the fourth of edward third the king commandeth in his writs not to choose any knights who had been guilty of crime or maintenance these warm men seldom fail to run into maintenance taken in a larger extent it is an unnatural sound to come from a man that is arbitrary in his neighborhood to talk of laws and liberties at westminster he is not a proper vehicle for such words which ought never to be profaned an habitual breaker of the laws to be made one of the law-makers is as if the benches in westminster hall should be filled with men out of newgate those who are of this temper cannot change their nature out of respect to their country quite contrary they will less scruple to do wrong to a nation where no body taketh it to himself than to particular men to whose resentments they are more immediately exposed in short they lie under such strong objections that the overbalance of better men cannot altogether purify an assembly where these unclean beasts are admitted twelve excessive spenders and unreasonable savers are to be excluded being both greedy from differing causes they are both of them diseases of infection and for that reason are not to be admitted into public assemblies a prodigal man must be greedy because he thinketh he can never spend enough the wretch must be so because he will never think he can hoard enough the world first admireth men's wisdom for getting money and then raileth at them if they do not throw it away so that the prodigal man is only the less unpopular extreme he is 
every jot as well prepared as the miser to fall out with his morals when once a good temptation is offered him to lay them aside on the other side some rich men are as eager to overtake those that are richer as a running horse is to get to the race post before the other that contendeth with him men often desire to heap rather because others have more than that they know what to do with that which they covet with so much impatience so that it is plain the fancy hath as great a share in this imaginary pleasure of gathering as it hath in love ambition or any other passion it is pretty sure that as no man was ever the richer for having a good estate if he did not look after it so neither will he be the honester if he hath never so much want of care will always create want of money so that whether a man is a beggar because he never had any money or because he can never keep any it is all one to those who are to trust him upon this head of prodigality it may be no unreasonable caution to be afraid of those who in former service have been extravagantly liberal to the public money trusting is so hazardous a thing that it should never be done but where it is necessary so that when trustees are found upon trial to be very lavish even without examining into the causes of it which are generally very suspicious it is a reasonable part of preventing wit to change hands or else the choosers will pay the penalty that belongeth to good nature so misplaced and the consequences will be attended with the aggravation of their not being made wiser by such a severe and costly warning thirteen it would be of very great use to take a general resolution throughout the kingdom that none should be chosen for a county but such as have either in possession or reversion a considerable estate in it nor for a borough except he be resiant or that he hath some estate in the county in present or expectancy there have been eminent men of law who were of opinion that in the case of a burgess of a town not resiant the court is to give judgment according to the statute notwithstanding custom to the contrary but not to insist now upon that the prudential part is argument enough to set up a rule to abrogate an ill custom there is not perhaps a greater cause of the corruption of parliaments than by adopting members who may be said to have no title by their births the juries are by the law to be ex vicinato and shall there be less care that the representatives of the people be so too sure the interest of the county is best placed in the hands of such as have some share in it the outliers are not so easily kept within the pale of the laws they are often chosen without being known which is more like choosing valentines than members of parliament the motive of their standing is more justly to be supposed that they may redress their own grievances which they know than those of the country to which they are strangers they are chosen at london to serve in cornwall etc and are often parties before they come to be representatives one would think the reproach it is for a county not to have men within their own circle to serve them in parliament should be argument enough to reject these trespassers without urging the ill consequences in other respects of their being admitted fourteen as in some cases it is advisable to give a total exclusion to men not fitly qualified so in others it is more proper to lay down a general rule of caution with allowance of some exceptions where men have given such proofs of themselves as create a right for them to be distinguished of this nature is that which i shall say concerning lawyers who by the same reason that they may be useful may be also very dangerous the negligence and want of application in gentlemen hath made them to be thought more necessary than naturally they are in parliament they have not only engrossed the chair of the speaker but that of a committee is hardly thought to be well filled except it be by a man of the robe this maketh it worthy of the more serious reflection of all gentlemen that it may be an argument to them to qualify themselves in parliamentary learning in such a manner 
as that they may rely upon their own abilities in order to the serving their country but to come to the point in question it is not without precedent that practicing lawyers have been excluded from serving in parliament and without following those patterns strictly i cannot but think it reasonable that whilst a parliament sitteth no member of parliament should plead at any bar the reason of it is in many respects strong in itself and is grown much stronger by the long sitting parliaments of late but i will not dwell upon this the matter now in question being concerning lawyers being elected which i conceive should be done with so much circumspection that probably it would not often happen if lawyers have great practice that ought to take them up if not it is no great sign of their ability and at the same time giveth a suspicion that they may be more liable to be tempted if it should be so in fact that no king ever wanted judges to soften the stiffness of the laws that were made so as to make them suit better with the reason of state and the convenience of the government it is no injury now to suppose it possible for lawyers in the house of commons so to behave themselves in the making of new laws as the better to make way for the having their robes lined with fur they are men used to argue on both sides of a question and if ordinary fees can inspire them with very good reasons in a very ill cause that faculty exercised in parliaments where it may be better encouraged may prove very inconvenient to those that choose them and therefore without arraigning a profession that it would be scandalous for a man not to honor one may by a suspicion which is the more excusable when it is in the behalf of the people imagine that the habit of taking money for their opinion may create in some such a forgetfulness to distinguish that they may take it for their vote they are generally men who by a laborious study hope to be advanced they have it in their eye as a reward for the toil they undergo this maketh them generally very slow and ill-disposed let the occasion never so much require it to wrestle with that soil where preferment groweth now if the supposition be in itself not unreasonable and that it should happen to be strengthened and confirmed by experience it will be very unnecessary to say any more upon this article but leave it to the election to consider of it fifteen i cannot forbear to put in a caveat against men tied to a party there must in every body be a leaning to that sort of men who profess some principles more than to others who go upon a different foundation but when a man is drowned in a party plunged in it beyond his depth he runneth a great hazard of being upon ill terms with good sense or morality if not with both of them such a man can hardly be called a free agent and for that reason is very unfit to be trusted with the people's liberty after he hath given up his own it is said that in some part of the indies they do so affect little feet that they keep them squeezed while they are children so that they stay at that small size after they are grown men one may say something like this of men locked up in a party they put their thoughts into such a narrow mould that they can never be enlarged nor released from their first confinements men in a party have liberty only for their motto in reality they are greater slaves than anybody else would care to make them a party even in times of peace though against the original contract and the bill of rights sets up and continues the exercise of martial law once enrolled the man that quitteth if they had their will would be hanged for a deserter they communicate anger to one another by contagion and it may be said that if too much light dazzleth the eyesight too much heat doth not less weaken the judgment heat reigneth in the fancy and reason which is a colder faculty of the brain taketh more time to be heard than the other will allow the heat of a party is like the burning of a fever and not a natural warmth evenly distributed to give life and vigor 
there was a time indeed when anger showed a good sign of honesty but that evidence is very much weakened by instances we have seen since the days of yore and the public-spirited collar hath been thrown off within the time of memory and lost almost all its credit with some people since they found what governments thought fit to make their so doing a step to their preferment a strong blustering wind seldom continues long in one corner some men knock loud only to be let in the bustle they make is animated by their private interest the outward blaze only is for religion and liberty the true lasting fire like that of the vestals which never went out is an eagerness to get somewhat for themselves a house of commons composed of such men would be more probably so many merchants incorporated in a regular company to make their particular adventures than men sent from the people to serve and represent them there are some splenetic gentlemen who confine their favorable opinion within so narrow a compass that they will not allow it to any man that was not hanged in the late reigns now by that rule one might expect they should rescue themselves from the disadvantage of being now alive and by abdicating a world so little worthy of them get a great name to themselves with the general satisfaction of all those they would leave behind them amongst the many other ill consequences of a stated party it is none of the least that it tempteth low and insignificant men to come upon the stage to expose themselves and to spoil business it turneth a cipher into a figure such an one as it is a man in a party is able to make a noise let it be never so empty a sound a weak man is easily blown out of his small senses by being mustered into a party he is flattered till he liketh himself so well that he taketh it extremely ill if he hath not an employment nothing is more in fashion than for men to desire good places and i doubt nothing is less so than to deserve them from nobody to somebody is such a violent stride that nature which hath the negative voice will not give its royal assent to it so that when insufficient men aim at being in business the worst of their enemies might out of malice to them pray for their preferment there could be no end if one did not stop till this theme had no more matter to furnish i will only say nothing is more evident than that the good of the nation hath been sacrificed to the animosities of several contending parties and without entering into the dispute which of them are more or less in the right it is pretty sure that whilst these opposite sets of angry men are playing at football they will break all the windows and do more hurt than their pretended zeal for the nation will ever make amends for in short a man so engaged is retained before the people take him for their counsel he hath such a reserve for his party that it is not advisable for those who would choose him to depend upon his professions all parties assuming such a dispensing power that by their sovereign authority they cancel and dissolve any act or promise that they do not afterwards approve these things considered those who will choose such men deserve whatever followeth sixteen pretenders to exorbitant merit in the late revolution are not without objection against them when they stand to serve in parliament it would not only be a low but a criminal kind of envy to deny a distinguishing justice to men who have been instrumental and active when the service of their country required it but there ought to be moderation in men's claims or else it is out of the power of our poor island to satisfy them it is true service of all kinds is grown much dearer like laborers wages which formerly occasioned several statutes to regulate them but now the men who only carried mortar to the building when it is finished think they are ill dealt with if they are not made master workmen they presently cry out the original contract is broken if their merit is not rewarded at their own rate too 
some will think there never ought to be an end of their rewards when indifferent judges would perhaps be puzzled to find out the beginning of their merit they bring in such large bills that they must be examined some bounds must be put to men's pretensions else the nation which is to pay the reckoning will every way think it a scurvy thing to be undone whether it be by being overrun by our enemies or by being exhausted by our friends there ought therefore to be deductions where they are reasonable the better to justify the paying what remaineth for example if any of these passionate lovers of the protestant religion should not think fit in their manner of living to give the least evidence of their morality their claims upon that head might sure be struck off without any injustice to them if there are any who set down great sums as a reward due to their zeal for rescuing property from the jaws of arbitrary power their pretensions may fairly be rejected if now they are so far from showing a care and tenderness of the laws that they look rather like counsel retained on the other side it is no less strange than i doubt it is true that some men should be so in love with their dear mistress old england with all her wrinkles as out of an heroic passion to swim over to rescue her from being ravaged and when they have done the feat the first thing after enjoyment is that they go about to strangle her for the sake of true love it is not fit that such ungenteel gallants should be too much encouraged and their arrogance for having done well at first will have no right to be excused if their so doing ill at last doth not make them a little more modest true merit like a river the deeper it is the less noise it maketh these loud proclaimers of their own deserts are not only to be suspected for their truth but the electors are to consider that such meritorious men lay an assessment upon those that choose them the public taxes are already heavy enough without the addition of these private reckonings it is therefore the safer way not to employ men who will expect more for their wages than the mistaken borough that sendeth them up to parliament could be sold for seventeen with all due regard to the noblest of callings military officers are out of their true element when they are misplaced in a house of commons things in this world ought to be well suited there are some appearances so unnatural that men are convinced by them without any other argument the very habit in some cases recommendeth or giveth offence if the judges upon the bench should instead of their furs which signify gravity and bespeak respect be clothed like the jockeys at newmarket or wear jackboots and steenkirks they would not in reality have less law but mankind would be so struck with this unusual object that it would be a great while before they could think it possible to receive justice from men so accoutred it is to some degree the same thing in this case such martial habits blue coats red stocking etc make them look very unlike grave senators one would almost swear they were creatures apart and of a differing species from the rest of the body in former times when only the recent shopkeeper was to represent his corporation which by the way is the law still at this day the military looks of one of these sons of mars would have stared the quaking member down again to his borough now the number of them is so increased that the peaceable part of the house may lawfully swear they are in fear of their lives from such an awful appearance of men of war it maketh the room look like a guard-house by such an ill-suited mixture but this is only the outside the bark of the argument the root goeth yet deeper against choosing such men whose talents ought to be otherwise applied their two capacities are so inconsistent that men's undertaking to serve both the cures will be the cause in a little time that we shall neither have men of war nor men of business good in their several kinds an officer is to give up his liberty to obey orders and it is necessarily incident to his calling that he should do so a member of parliament 
is originally to be tender of his own liberty that other men may the better trust him with theirs an officer is to enable himself by his courage improved by skill and experience to support the laws if invaded when they are made but he is not supposed to be at leisure enough to understand how they should be made a member of parliament is to fill his thoughts with what may best conduce to the civil administration which is enough to take up the whole man let him be never so much raised above the ordinary level these two opposite qualifications being placed in one man make him such an ambiguous divided creature that he doth not know how to move it is best to keep men within their proper sphere few men have understanding enough exactly to fill even one narrow circle fewer are able to fill two especially when they are both of so great compass and that they are so contrary in their own natures the wages he hath as a member and those he receiveth as an officer are paid for services that are very differing and in the doubt which of them should be preferably performed it is likely the greater salary may direct him without the further inducements of complying most where he may expect most advantage by it in short if his dependence is not very great it will make him a scurvy officer if it is great it will make him a scurvier member eighteen men under the scandal of being thought private pensioners are too fair a mark to escape being considered in reference to the point in question in case of plain evidence it is not to be supposed possible that men convicted of such a crime should ever again be elected the difficulty is in determining what is to be done in case of suspicion there are suspicions so well grounded that they may pretend to have the force of proofs provided the penalty goeth only to the forbearing to trust but not extending it so far as to punish there must be some things plain and express to justify the latter but circumstances may be sufficient for the former as where men have had such sudden cures of their ill humors and opposition to the court that it is out of the way of ordinary methods of recovery from such distempers which have a much slower progress it must naturally be imputed to some specific that maketh such a quick alteration of the whole mass of blood where men have raised their way of living without any visible means to support them in it a suspicion is justified even by the example of the law which in cases of this kind though of an inferior nature doth upon this foundation not only raise inferences but inflict punishments where men are immoral and scandalous in their lives and dispense familiarly with the rules by which the world is governed for the better preserving the bonds of human society it must be a confidence very ill placed to conclude it impossible for such men to yield to a temptation well offered and pursued when the truth is the habit of such bon vivant which is the fashionable word maketh a suspicion so likely that it is very hard to believe it to be true if there should be nothing but the general report even that is not to be neglected common fame is the only liar that deserveth to have some respect still reserved to it though she telleth many an untruth she often hitteth right and most especially when she speaketh ill of men her credit hath sometimes been carried too far when it hath gone to the divesting men of anything of which they were possessed without more express evidence to justify such a proceeding if there was a doubt whether there ever was any corruption of this kind it would alter the question but sure that will not bear the being controverted we are told that charles v sent over into england one million two hundred thousand crowns to be distributed amongst the leading men to encourage them to carry on elections here was the protestant religion to be bought out for a valuable consideration according to law though not according to gospel which exalteth it above any price that can be set upon it now except we had reason to believe that the virtue of the world is improved since that time 
we can as little doubt that such temptations may be offered as that they may be received it will be owned that there is to be a great tenderness in suspecting but it must be allowed at the same time that there ought not to be less in trusting where the people are so much concerned especially when the penalty upon the party suspected goeth no further than a suspension of that confidence which it is necessary to have in those who are to represent the nation in parliament nineteen i cannot omit the giving a caution against admitting men to be chosen who have places of any value there needeth the less to be said upon this article the truth of the proposition being supported by such plain arguments sure no man hath such a plentiful spring of thought as that all that floweth from it is too much to be applied to the business of parliament it is not less sure that a member of parliament of all others ought not to be exempted from the rule that no man should serve two masters it doth so split a man's thoughts that no man can know how to make a fitting distribution of them to two such differing capacities it exposeth men to be suspected and tempted more than is convenient for the public service or for the mutual good opinion of one another which there ought to be in such an assembly it either giveth a real dependence upon the government which is inconsistent with the necessity there is that a member of parliament should be disengaged or at least it hath the appearance of it which maketh them not look like free men though they should have virtue enough to be so more reasons would lessen the weight of this last which is that a bill to this effect commonly called the self-denying bill passed even this last house of commons a greater demonstration of the irresistible strength of truth cannot possibly be given so that a copy of that bill in every county or borough would hardly fail of discouraging such pretenders from standing or at least it would prevent their success if their own modesty should not restrain them from attempting it twenty if distinctions may be made upon particular men or remarks fixed upon their votes in parliament they must be allowed in relation to those gentlemen who for reasons best known to themselves thought fit to be against the triennial bill the liberty of opinion is the thing in the world that ought least to be controlled and especially in parliament but as that is an undoubted assertion it is not less so that when men sin against their own light give a vote against their own thought they must not plead privilege of parliament against the being arraigned for it by others after they are convicted of it by themselves there cannot be a man who in his definition of a house of commons will state it to be an assembly that for the better redressing of grievances the people feel and for the better furnishing such supplies as they can bear is to continue if the king so pleaseth for his whole reign this could be as little intended as to throw all into one hand and to renounce the claim to any liberty but so much as the sovereign authority would allow it destroyeth the end of parliaments it maketh use of the letter of the law to extinguish the life of it it is in truth some kind of disparagement to so plain a thing that so much has been said and written upon it and one may say it is such an affront to these gentlemen's understandings to censure this vote only as a mistake that as the age goeth it is less discredit to them to call it by its right name and if that is rightly understood by those who are to choose them i suppose they will let them exercise their liberty of conscience at home and not make men their trustees who in this solemn instance have such an unwillingness to surrender it must be owned that this bill hath met with very hard fortune and yet that doth not in the least diminish the value of it it had in it such a root of life that it might be said it was not dead but slept and we see that the last session it was revived and animated by the royal assent when once fully informed of the consequence as well as of the justice of it 
in the meantime after having told my opinion who ought not to be chosen if i should be asked who ought to be my answer must be choose englishmen and when i have said that to deal honestly i will not undertake that they are easy to be found end of some cautions offered to the consideration of those who are to choose members to serve for the ensuing parliament read by john greenman this is section nineteen of the complete works of george savile first marquis of halifax this librivox recording is in the public domain a rough draft of a new model at sea sixteen ninety four i will make no other introduction to the following discourse than that as the importance of our being strong at sea was ever very great so in our present circumstances it is grown to be much greater because as formerly our force of shipping contributed greatly to our trade and safety so now it is become indispensably necessary to our very being it may be said now to england martha martha thou art busy about many things but one thing is necessary to the question what shall we do to be saved in this world there is no other answer but this look to your moat the first article of an englishman's political creed must be that he believeth in the sea etc without that there needeth no general counsel to pronounce him incapable of salvation here we are in an island confined to it by god almighty not as a penalty but a grace and one of the greatest that can be given to mankind happy confinement that hath made us free rich and quiet a fair portion in this world and very well worth the preserving a figure that ever hath been envied and could never be imitated by our neighbours our situation hath made greatness abroad by land conquests unnatural things to us it is true we have made excursions and glorious ones too which make our names great in history but they did not last admit the english to be giants in courage yet they must not hope to succeed in making war against heaven which seemeth to have enjoined them to acquiesce in being happy within their own circle it is no paradox to say that england hath its root in the sea and a deep one too from whence it sendeth its branches into both the indies we may say further in our present case that if allegiance is due to protection ours to the sea is due from that rule since by that and by that alone we are to be protected and if we have of late suffered usurpation of other methods contrary to the homage we owe to that which must preserve us it is time now to restore the sea to its right and as there is no repentance effectual without amendment so there is not a moment to be lost in the going about it it is not pretended to launch into such a voluminous treatise as to set down everything to which so comprehensive a subject might lead me for as the sea hath little less variety in it than the land so the naval force of england extendeth itself into a great many branches each of which are important enough to require a discourse apart and peculiarly applied to it but there must be preference to some considerations above others when the weight of them is so visibly superior that it cannot be contested it is there first that the foundations are to be laid of our naval o economy amongst these there is one article which in its own nature must be allowed to be the cornerstone of the building the choice of officers with the discipline and encouragement belonging to them upon this head only i shall then take the liberty to venture my opinion into the world with a real submission to those 
who may offer anything better for the advantage of the public. The first question then will be, out of what sort of men the officers of the fleet are to be chosen, and this immediately leadeth us to the present controversy between the gentlemen and the torpolins. The usual objections on both sides are too general to be relied upon. Partiality and common prejudices direct most men's opinions, without entering into the particular reasons which ought to be the ground of it. There is so much ease in acquiescing in generals, that the ignorance of those who cannot distinguish, and the largeness of those who will not, maketh men very apt to decline the trouble of stricter inquiries which they think too great a price for being in the right, let it be never so valuable. This maketh them judge in the lump, and either let their opinions swim along with the stream of the world, or give them up wholly to be directed by success. The effect of this is that they change their minds upon every present uneasiness, wanting a steady foundation upon which their judgment should be formed. This is a perching upon the twigs of things, and not going to the root. But sure the matter in question deserveth to be examined in another manner, since so much dependeth upon it. To state the thing impartially, it must be owned that it seemeth to lie fairest for the tarpaulin. It giveth an impression that must have so much weight as to make a man's opinion lean very much on that side. It carrieth so much authority with it it seemeth to be so unquestionable that those are fittest to command at sea who have not only made it their calling but their element that there must naturally be a prejudice to anything then can be said against it there must therefore be some reason extraordinary to support the argument on the other side or else the gentlemen could never enter the lists against such a violent objection which seemeth not to be resisted. I will introduce my argument with an assertion, which as I take to be true almost in all cases, so it is necessary to be explained and enforced in this. The assertion is that there is hardly a single proposition to be made which is not deceitful, and the tying our reason too close to it may in many cases be destructive circumstances must come in and are to be made a part of the matter of which we are to judge positive decisions are always dangerous more especially in politics a man who will be master of an argument must do like a skilful general who sendeth scouts on all sides to see whether there may not be an enemy so he must look round to see what objections can be made and not go in a straight line which is the ready way to lead him into a mistake. Before, then, that we conclude what sort of men are fittest to command at sea, a principle is to be laid down, that there is a differing consideration to be had of such a subject matter, as is in itself distinct and independent, and of such an one as being a limb of a body, or a wheel of a frame. There is a necessity of suiting it to the rest, and preserving the harmony of the whole. A man must not in that case restrain himself to the separate consideration of that single part, but must take care it may fall in and agree with the shape of the whole creature of which it is a member. According to this proposition, which I take to be indisputable, it will not, I hope, appear an affectation or an extravagant fit of unseasonable politics, if before i enter into the particular state of the present question i say something of the government of england and make that the groundwork of what sort of men are most proper to be made use of to command at sea the forms of government to which england must be subjected are either absolute monarchy a commonwealth or a mixed monarchy as it is now with those natural alterations that the exigency of affairs may from time to time suggest. As to absolute monarchy, I will not allow myself to be transported into such invectives as are generally made against it. Neither am I ready to enter into the aggravating style of calling everything slavery that restraineth men in any part of their freedom. One may discern in this, as in most other things, the good and bad of it. 
we see by too near an instance that france doth by it it doth not only struggle with the rest of christendom but is in a fair way of giving law to it this is owing in great measure to a despotic and undivided power the uncontrollable authority of the directive councils maketh everything move without disorder or opposition which must give an advantage that is plain enough of itself without being proved by the melancholy experience we have of it at this time i see and admire this yet i consider at the same time that all things of this kind are comparative that as on one side without government men cannot enjoy what belongeth to them in particular nor can a nation be secure or preserve itself in general so on the other side the end of government being that mankind should live in some competent state of freedom it is very unnatural to have the end destroyed by the means that were originally made use of to attain it in this respect something is to be ventured rather than submit to such a precarious state of life as would make it a burden to a reasonable creature and therefore after i have owned the advantages in some kind of an unlimited government yet while they are attended with so many other discouraging circumstances i cannot think but that they may be bought too dear and if it should be so that it is not possible for a state to be great and glorious unless the subjects are wretchedly miserable i am not ashamed to own my low-spirited frailty in preferring such a model of government as may agree with the reasonable enjoyment of a free people before such a one by which empire is to be extended at such an unnatural price besides whatever men's opinions may be one way or another in the general question there is an argument in our case that shutteth the door to any answer to it viz we cannot subsist under a despotic power our very being would be destroyed by it for we are to consider we are very little spot in the map of the world and make a great figure only by trade which is the creature of liberty one destroyed the other falleth to the ground by a natural consequence that will not admit a dispute if we would be measured by our acres we are poor inconsiderable people we are exalted above our natural bounds by our good laws and our excellent constitution by this we are not only happy at home but considerable abroad our situation our humor our trade do all concur to strengthen this argument so that all other reasons must give place to such a one as maketh it out that there is no mean between a free nation and no nation we are no more a people nor england can no longer keep its name from the moment that our liberties are extinguished the vital strength that should support us being withdrawn we should then be no more than the carcass of a nation with no other security than that of contempt and to subsist upon no other tenure than that we should be below the giving temptation to our stronger neighbors to devour us in my judgment therefore there is such a short decision to be made upon this subject that in relation to england an absolute monarchy is as unreasonable a thing to be wished as i hope it will be impossible to be obtained it must be considered in the next place whether england is likely to be turned into a commonwealth it is hard at any time to determine what will be the shape of the next revolution much more at this time would it be inexcusably arrogant to undertake it who can foresee whether it will be from without or from within or from both whether with or without the concurrence of the people whether regularly produced or violently imposed i shall not therefore magisterially declare it impossible that a commonwealth should be settled here but i may give my humble opinion that according to all appearances it is very improbable i will first lay it down for a principle that it is not a sound way of arguing to say that if it can be out that the form of a commonwealth will best suit with the interest of the nation it must for that reason of necessity prevail i will not deny 
but that interest will not lie is a right maxim wherever it is sure to be understood else one had as good a firm that no man in particular nor mankind in general can ever be mistaken a nation is a great while before they can see and generally they must feel first before their sight is quite cleared this maketh it so long before they can see their interest that for the most part it is too late for them to pursue it if men must be supposed always to follow their true interest it must be meant of a new manufactory of mankind by god almighty there must be some new clay the old stuff never yet made any such infallible creature this being premised it is to be inquired whether instead of inclination or a leaning towards a commonwealth there is not in england a general dislike to it if this be so as i take it to be by a very great disparity in numbers it will be in vain to dispute the reason whilst humor is against it allowing the weight that is due to the argument which may be alleged for it yet if the herd is against it the going about to convince them would have no other effect than to show that nothing can be more impertinent than good reasons when they are misplaced or ill-timed i must observe that there must be some previous dispositions in all great changes to facilitate and to make way for them i think it not at all absurd to affirm that such resolutions are seldom made at all except by the general preparations of men's minds they are half made before it is plainly visible that men go about them though it seemeth to me that this argument alone maketh all others unnecessary yet i must take notice that besides what hath been said upon this subject there are certain preliminaries to the first building a commonwealth some materials absolutely necessary for the carrying on such a fabric which at present are wanting amongst us i mean virtue morality diligence or at least hypocrisy now this age is so plain dealing as not to dissemble so far as to an outward pretense of qualities which seem at present so unfashionable and under so much discountenance from hence we may draw a plain and natural inference that a commonwealth is not fit for us because we are not fit for a commonwealth this being granted the supposition of this form of government of england with all its consequences as to the present question must be excluded and absolute monarchy having been so too by the reasons at once alleged it will without further examination fall to a mixed government as we now are i will not say that there is never to be any alteration the constitution of the several parts that concur to make up the frame of the present government may be altered in many things in some for the better and in others perhaps for the worse according as circumstances shall arise to induce a change and as passion and interest shall have more or less influence upon the public councils but still if it remaineth in the whole so far a mixed monarchy that there shall be a restraint upon the prince as to the exercise of a despotic power it is enough to make it a groundwork for the present question it appeareth then that a bounded monarchy is that kind of government which will most probably prevail and continue in england from whence it must follow as hath been hinted before that every considerable part ought to be so composed as the better to induce to the preserving the harmony of the whole constitution the navy is of so great importance that it would be disparaged by calling it less than the life and soul of government therefore to apply the argument to the subject we are upon in case the officers be all tarpaulins it would be in reality too great a tendency to a commonwealth such a part of the constitution being democratically disposed may be suspected to endeavor to bring it into that shape and where the influence must be so strong the supposition will be the more justifiable in short if the maritime force 
which is the only thing that can defend us, should be wholly directed by the lower sort of men, with an entire exclusion of the nobility and gentry, it will not be easy to answer the arguments supported by so great a probability that such a scheme would not only lean toward a democracy, but directly lead us into it. Let us now examine the contrary proposition, viz., that all officers should be gentlemen. Here the objection lieth so fair of its introducing an arbitrary government, that it is as little to be answered in that respect as the former is in the other. Gentlemen, in a general definition, will be suspected to lie more than other men under temptations of being made instruments of unlimited power. Their relations, their way of living, their taste of the entertainments of the court, inspire an ambition that generally draweth their inclinations toward it, besides the gratifying of their interests. Men of quality are often taken with the ornaments of government, the splendor dazzled them so, as that their judgments are surprised by it, and there will be always some that have so little remorse for invading other men's liberties, that it maketh them less solicitous to preserve their own. These things throw them naturally into such a dependence as might give a dangerous bias. If they alone were in command at sea, it would make that great wheel turn by an irregular motion, and instead of being the chief means of preserving the whole frame, might come to be the chief instruments to discompose and dissolve it. The two former exclusive propositions being necessarily to be excluded in this question, there remaineth no other expedient, neither can any other conclusion be drawn from the argument as it hath been stated, than that there must be a mixture in the navy of gentlemen and tarpaulins, as there is in the constitution of the government, of power and liberty. This mixture is not to be so rigorously defined as to set down the exact proportion there is to be of each. The greater or lesser number must be directed by circumstances of which the government is to judge, and which make it improper to set such bounds, as that upon no occasion it shall on either side be lessened or enlarged. It is possible the men of Wapping may think they are injured, by giving them any partners in the dominion of the sea. They may take it unkindly to be jostled in their own element by men of such a different education, that they may be said to be of another species. They will be apt to think it an usurpation upon them, and notwithstanding the instances that are against them, and which give a kind of prescription on the other side, they will not easily acquiesce in what they conceive to be a hardship to them but i shall in a good measure reconcile myself to them by what follows viz the gentlemen shall not be capable of bearing office at sea except they be tarpaulins too that is to say except they are so trained up by a continued habit of living at sea that they may have a right to be admitted free denizens of wapping upon this dependeth the whole matter and indeed here lieth the difficulty because the gentlemen brought up under the connivance of a looser discipline and of an easier admittance will take it heavily to be reduced within the fetters of such a new model and i conclude they will be so extremely averse to that which they call an unreasonable yoke upon them that their original consent is never to be expected but if it appeareth to be convenient and which is more that it is necessary for the preservation of the whole that it should be so the government must be called in aid to suppress these first boilings of discontent. The rules must be imposed with such authority, and the execution of them must be so well supported, that by degrees their impatience will be subdued, and they will concur in an establishment to which they will every day be more reconciled. They will find it will take away the objections which are now thrown upon them of setting up for masters without having ever been apprentices, or at least without having served out their time. Mankind naturally swelleth against favor and partiality. Their belief of their own merit maketh men object them to a prosperous competitor, even when there is no pretense for it. 
but when there is the least handle offered to be sure it will be taken so in this case when a gentleman is preferred at sea the tarpaulin is very apt to impute it to friend or favor but if that gentleman hath before his preferment passed through all the steps which lead to it so that he smelleth as much of pitch and tar as those that were swaddled in sailcloth his having an escutcheon will be so far from doing him harm that it will set him upon the advantage ground it will draw a real respect to his quality when so supported and give him an influence and authority infinitely superior to that which the mere seaman can ever pretend to when a gentleman hath learned how to obey he will grow very much fitter to command his own memory will advise him not to inflict too rigorous punishments he will better resist the temptations of authority which are great when he reflecteth how much he hath at other times wished it might be gently exercised when he was liable to the rigor of it when the undistinguished discipline of a ship hath tamed the young mastership which is apt to arise from a gentleman's birth and education he then groweth proud in the right place and valueth himself first upon knowing his duty and then upon doing it in plain english men of quality in their several degrees must either restore themselves to a better opinion both for morality and diligence or else quality itself will be in danger of being extinguished the original gentleman is almost lost in strictness when posterity doth not still further adorn by their virtue the escutcheon their ancestors first got for them by their merit they deserve the penalty of being deprived of it to expect that quality alone should waft men up into places and employments is as unreasonable as to think that a ship because it is carved and gilded should be fit to go to sea without sails or tackling but when a gentleman maketh no other use of his quality than to incite him the more to his duty it will give such a true and settled superiority as must destroy all competition from those that are below him it is time now to go to the probationary qualifications of an officer at sea and i have some to offer which i have digested in my thoughts i hope impartially that they may not be speculative notions but things easy and practicable if the directing powers will give due countenance and encouragement to the execution of them but whilst i am going about to set them down though this little essay was made to no other end than to introduce them i am upon better recollection induced to put a restraint upon myself and rather retract the promise i made at the beginning than by advising the particular methods by which i conceive the good end that is aimed at may be obtained to incur the imputation of the thing of the world of which i would least be guilty which is of anticipating by my private opinion the judgment of the parliament or seeming out of slender stock of reason to dictate to the supreme wisdom of the nation they will no doubt consider the present establishments for discipline at sea which are many of them very good and if well executed might go a great way in present question but i will not say they are so perfect but that others may be added to make them more effectual and that some more supplemental expedients may be necessary to complete what is yet defective and whenever the parliament shall think fit to take this matter into their consideration i am sure they will not want for their direction the auxiliary reasons of any man without doors much less of one whose thoughts are so entirely and unaffectedly resigned to whatever they shall determine in this or anything else relating to the public end of a rough draft of a new model at sea sixteen ninety four Read by John Greenman. This is section twenty of the complete works of George Saville, first Marquis of Halifax. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Maxims of State. One, that a prince who falleth out with laws breaketh with his best friends. Two 
that the exalting his own authority above his laws is like letting in his enemy to surprise his gods the laws are the only gods he can be sure will never run away from him three a prince that will say he can do no good except he may do everything teaches the people to say they are slaves if they must not do whatever they have a mind to four that power and liberty are like heat and moisture where they are well mixed everything prospers where they are single they are destructive five that arbitrary power is like most other things that are very hard they are also very apt to break six that the profit of places should be measured as they are more or less conducing to the public service and if business is more necessary than splendor the instrument of it ought in proportion to be better paid that the contrary method is as impertinent as it would be to let the carving of a ship cost more than all the rest of it seven that where the least useful part of the people have the most credit with the prince men will conclude that the way to get everything is to be good for nothing eight that an extravagant gift to one man raiseth the market to everybody else so that in consequence the unlimited bounty of an unthinking prince maketh him a beggar let him have never so much money nine that if ordinary beggars are whipped the daily beggars in fine clothes out of proportionable respect to their quality ought to be hanged ten that pride is as loud a beggar as want and a great deal more saucy eleven that a prince who will give more to importunity than merit had as good set out a proclamation to all his loving subjects forbidding them to do well upon the penalty of being undone by it twelve that a wise prince will not oblige his courtiers who are birds of prey so as to disoblige his people who are beasts of burden thirteen that it is safer for a prince to judge of men by what they do to one another than what they do to him fourteen that it is a gross mistake to think that a knave between man and man can be honest to a king whom of all others men generally make the least scruple to deceive fifteen that a prince who can ever trust the man that hath once deceived him loseth the right of being faithfully dealt with by any other person sixteen that it is not possible for a prince to find out such an honest knave as will let nobody else cheat him seventeen that if a prince doth not show an aversion to knaves there will be an inference that will be very natural let it be never so unmannerly eighteen that a prince who followeth his own opinion too soon is in danger of repenting it too late nineteen that it is less dangerous for a prince to mind too much what the people say than too little twenty that a prince is to take care that the greater part of the people may not be angry at the same time for though the first beginning of their ill humour should be against one another yet if not stopped it will naturally end in anger against him twenty one that if princes would reflect how much they are in power of their ministers they would be more circumspect in the choice of them twenty two that a wise prince will support good servants against men's anger and not support ill ones against their complaint twenty three that parties in a state generally like freebooters hang out false colors the pretense is the public good the real business is to catch prizes like the tartars wherever they succeed instead of improving their victory they presently fall upon the baggage twenty four that a prince may play so long between two parties that they may in time join together and be in earnest with him twenty five 
that there is more dignity in open violence than in unskilful cunning of a prince who goeth about to impose upon the people twenty six that the people will ever suspect the remedies for the diseases of the state where they are wholly excluded from seeing how they are prepared twenty seven that changing hands without changing measures is as if a drunkard in a dropsy should change his doctors and not his diet twenty eight that a prince is to watch that his reason may not be so subdued by his nature as not to be so much a man of peace as to be a jest in an army nor so much a man of war as to be out of his element in his council twenty nine that a man who cannot mind his own business is not to be trusted with the king's thirty that quality alone should only serve to make a show in the embroidered part of the government but that ignorance though never so well born should never be admitted to spoil the public business thirty one that he who thinks his place below him will certainly be below his place thirty two that when a prince's example ceaseth to have the force of a law it is a sure sign that his power is wasting and that there is but little distance between men's neglecting to imitate and their refusing to obey thirty three that a people may let a king fall yet still remain a people but if a king let his people slip from him he is no longer a king end of maxims of state this is section twenty one of the complete works of george saville first marquis of halifax this librivox recording is in the public domain advertisement and a letter sent by his lordship to charles cotton esq upon his new translation and dedication of montaigne's essays advertisement since the death of the ingenious translator of these essays an imperfect transcript of the following letter was intended for the press but having the good fortune to meet with a more correct copy i thought myself under a necessity of publishing it with this third edition not only to do justice to his memory but to the great person he chose for his patron m g a letter sent by his lordship to charles cotton esq upon his new translation and dedication of montaigne's essays sir i have too long delayed my thanks to you for giving me such an obliging evidence of your remembrance that alone would have been a welcome present but when joined with the book in the world i am the best entertained with it raiseth a strong desire in me to be better known where i am sure to be so much pleased i have till now thought wit could not be translated and do still retain so much of that opinion that i believe it impossible except by one whose genius cometh up to that of the author you have so kept the original strength of his thought that it almost tempts a man to believe the transmigration of souls and that his being used to the hills is come into the moorlands to reward us here in england for doing him more right than his country will afford him he hath by your means mended his first edition to transplant and make him ours is not only a valuable acquisition to us but a just censure of the critical impertinence of those french scribblers who have taken pains to make little cavils and exceptions to lessen the reputation of this great man whom nature hath made too big to confine himself to the exactness of a studied style he let his mind have its full flight and showeth by a generous kind of negligence that he did not write for praise but to give to the world a true picture of himself and of mankind he scorned affected periods or to please the mistaken reader with an empty chime of words he hath no affectation to set himself out and dependeth wholly upon the natural force of what is his own and the excellent application of what he borroweth you see sir i have kindness enough for m de montaigne to be your rival but nobody can pretend to be in equal competition with you 
i do willingly yield which is no small matter for a man to do to a more prosperous lover and if you will repay this piece of justice with another pray believe that he who can translate such an author without doing him wrong must not only make me glad but proud of being his very humble servant halifax end of advertisement and a letter sent by his lordship to charles cotton esq upon his new translation and dedication of montaigne's essays this is section twenty two of the complete works of george savile first marquis of halifax this librivox recording is in the public domain a character of king charles the second read by john greenman one of his religion a character differeth from a picture only in this every part of it must be like but it is not necessary that every feature should be comprehended in it as in a picture only some of the most remarkable this prince at his first entrance into the world had adversity for his introducer which is generally thought to be no ill one but in his case it proved so and laid the foundation of most of those misfortunes or errors that were the causes of the great objections made to him the first effect it had was in relation to his religion the ill-bred familiarity of the scotch divines had given him a distaste of that part of the protestant religion he was left then to the little remnant of the church of england in the faubourg st germain which made such a kind of figure as might easily be turned in such a manner as to make him lose his veneration for it in a refined country where religion appeared in pomp and splendor the outward appearance of such unfashionable men was made an argument against their religion and a young prince not averse to raillery was the more susceptible of a contempt for it the company he kept the men in his pleasures and the arguments of state that he should not appear too much a protestant whilst he expected assistance from a popish prince all these together with a habit encouraged by an application to his pleasures did so loosen and untie him from his first impressions that i take it for granted after the first year or two he was no more a protestant if you ask me what he was my answer must be that he was of the religion of a young prince in his warm blood whose enquiries were more applied to find arguments against believing than to lay any settled foundations for acknowledging providence mysteries etc a general creed and no very long one may be presumed to be the utmost religion of one whose age and inclination could not well spare any thoughts that did not tend to his pleasures in this kind of indifference or unthinkingness which is too natural in the beginnings of life to be heavily censured i will suppose he might pass some considerable part of his youth i must presume too that no occasions were lost during that time to insinuate everything to bend him towards popery great art without intermission against youth and easiness which are seldom upon their guard must have its effect a man is to be admired if he resisteth and therefore cannot reasonably be blamed if he yieldeth to them when the critical minute was i'll not undertake to determine but certainly the inward conviction doth generally precede the outward declarations at what distances dependeth upon men's several complexions and circumstances no stated period can be fixed it will be said that he had not religion enough to have conviction that is a vulgar error conviction indeed is not a proper word but where a man is convinced by reason but in the common acceptation it is applied to those who cannot tell why they are so if men can be at least as positive in a mistake as when they are in the right 
they may be as clearly convinced when they do not know why as when they do i must presume that no man of the king's age and his methods of life could possibly give a good reason for changing the religion in which he was born let it be what it will but our passions are much oftener convinced than our reason he had but little reading and that tending to his pleasures more than to his instruction in the library of a young prince the solemn follies are not much rumpled books of a lighter digestion have the dog's ears some pretend to be very precise in the time of his reconciling the cardinal de retz etc i will not enter into it minutely but whenever it was it is observable that the government of france did not think it advisable to discover it openly upon which such obvious reflections may be made that i will not mention them such a secret can never be put into a place which is so closely stopped that there shall be no chinks whispers went about particular men had intimations cromwell had his advertisements in other things and this was as well worth his paying for there was enough said of it to startle a great many though not universally diffused so much that if the government here had not crumpled of itself his right alone with that and other clogs upon it would hardly have thrown it down i conclude that when he came into england he was as certainly a roman catholic as that he was a man of pleasure both very consistent by visible experience it is impertinent to give reasons for men's changing their religion none can give them but themselves as every man has quite a different way of arguing a thing which may very well be accounted for they are differing kinds of wit to be quick to find a fault and to be capable to find out a truth there must be industry in the last the first requires only a lively heat that catcheth hold of the weak side of any thing but to choose the strong one is another talent the reason why men of wit are often the laziest in their inquiries is that their heat carrieth their thoughts so fast that they are apt to be tired and they faint in the drudgery of a continued application have not men of great wit in all times permitted their understandings to give way to their first impressions it taketh off from the diminution when a man doth not mind a thing and the king had then other business the inferior part of the man was then in possession and the faculties of the brain as to serious and painful inquiries were laid asleep at least though not extinguished careless men are most subject to superstition those who do not study reason enough to make it their guide have more unevenness as they have neglects so they have starts and frights dreams will serve the turn omens and sicknesses have violent and sudden effects upon them nor is the strength of an argument so effectual from its intrinsic force as by its being well suited to the temper of the party the genteel part of the catholic religion might tempt a prince that had more of the fine gentleman than his governing capacity required and the exercise of indulgence to sinners being more frequent in it than of inflicting penance might be some recommendation mistresses of that faith are stronger specifics in this case than any that are in physic the roman catholics complained of his breach of promise to them very early footnote one upon the words of his declaration there were broad peepings out glimpses so often repeated that to discerning eyes it was flaring in the very first year there were such suspicions as produced melancholy shakings of the head which were very significant his unwillingness to marry a protestant was remarkable though both the catholic and the christian crown would have adopted her very early in his youth when any german princess was proposed he put off the discourse with raillery a thousand little circumstances were a kind of accumulative evidence which in these cases 
may be admitted men that were earnest protestants were under the sharpness of his displeasure expressed by raillery as well as by other ways men near him have made discoveries from sudden breakings out in discourse etc which showed there was a root it was not the least skilful part of his concealing himself to make the world think he leaned towards an indifference in religion he had sicknesses before his death in which he did not trouble any protestant divines those who saw him upon his deathbed saw a great deal as to his writing those papers footnote two two papers in defense of the roman catholic religion found in this king's strong box in his own hand and published by king james the second afterwards he might do it though neither his temper nor education made him very fit to be an author yet in this case a known topic so very often repeated he might write it all himself and yet not one word of it his own that church's argument doth so agree with men unwilling to take pains the temptation of putting an end to all the trouble of inquiring is so great that it must be very strong reason that can resist the king had only his mere natural faculties without any acquisitions to improve them so that it is no wonder if an argument which gave such ease and relief to his mind made such an impression that with thinking often of it as men are apt to do of everything they like he might by the effect chiefly of his memory put together a few lines with his own hand without any help at the time in which there was nothing extraordinary but that one so little inclined to write at all should prevail with himself to do it with the solemnity of a casuist two his dissimulation one great objection made to him was the concealing himself and disguising his thoughts in this there ought a latitude to be given it is a defect not to have it at all and a fault to have it too much human nature will not allow the mean like all other things as soon as ever men get to do them well they cannot easily hold from doing them too much tis the case even in the least things as singing etc in france he was to dissemble injuries and neglects from one reason in england he was dissembled too though for other causes a king upon the throne hath as great temptations though of another kind to dissemble as a king in exile the king of france might have his times of dissembling as much with him as he could have to do it with the king of france so he was in a school no king can be so little inclined to dissemble but he must needs learn it from his subjects who every day give him such lessons of it dissimulation is like most other qualities it hath two sides it is necessary and yet it is dangerous too to have none at all layeth a man open to contempt to have too much exposeth him to suspicion which is only the less dishonorable inconvenience if a man doth not take very great precautions he is never so much showed as when he endeavoreth to hide himself one man cannot take more pains to hide himself than another will do to see into him especially in the case of kings it is none of the exalted faculties of the mind since there are chambermaids will do it better than any prince in christendom men given to dissembling are like rooks at play they will cheat for shillings they are so used to it the vulgar definition of dissembling is downright lying that kind of it which is less ill-bred cometh pretty near it only princes and persons of honor must have gentler words given to their faults than the nature of them may in themselves deserve princes dissemble with too many not to have it discovered no wonder then that he carried it so far that it was discovered men compared notes and got evidence so that those whose morality would give them leave took it for an excuse for serving him ill those who knew his face fixed their eyes there and thought it of more importance to see than to hear what he said 
his face was as little a blab as most men's yet though it could not be called a prattling face it would sometimes tell tales to a good observer when he thought fit to be angry he had a very peevish memory there was hardly a blot that escaped him at the same time that this showed the strength of his dissimulation it gave warning too it fitted his present purpose but it made a discovery that put men more upon their guard against him only self-flattery furnisheth perpetual arguments to trust again the comfortable opinion men have of themselves keepeth up human society which would be more than half destroyed without it three his amour mistresses etc it may be said that his inclinations to love were the effects of health and a good constitution with as little mixture of the seraphic part as ever man had and though from that foundation men often raise their passions i am apt to think his stayed as much as any man's ever did in the lower region this made him like easy mistresses they were generally resigned to him while he was abroad with an implied bargain heroic refined lovers place a good deal of their pleasure in the difficulty both for the vanity of conquest and as a better earnest of their kindness after he was restored mistresses were recommended to him which is no small matter in a court and not unworthy the thoughts even of a party a mistress either dexterous in herself or well instructed by those that are so may be very useful to her friends not only in the immediate hours of her ministry but by her influences and insinuations at other times it was resolved generally by others whom he should have in his arms as well as whom he should have in his counsels of a man who was so capable of choosing he chose as seldom as any man that ever lived he had more properly at least in the beginning of his time a good stomach to his mistresses than any great passion for them his taking them from others was never learnt in a romance and indeed fitter for a philosopher than a knight-errant his patience for their frailties showed him no exact lover it is a heresy according to a true lover's creed ever to forgive an infidelity or the appearance of it love of ease will not do it where the heart is much engaged but where mere nature is the motive it is possible for a man to think righter than the common opinion and to argue that a rival taketh away nothing but the heart and leaveth all the rest in his latter times he had no love but insensible engagements that made it harder than most might apprehend to untie them the politics might have their part a secret a commission a confidence in critical things though it doth not give a lease for a precise term of years yet there may be difficulties in dismissing them there may be no love all the while perhaps the contrary he was said to be as little constant as they were thought to be though he had no love he must have some appetite or else he could not keep them for mere ease or for the love of sauntering mistresses are frequently apt to be uneasy they are in all respects craving creatures so that though the taste of those joys might be flattened yet a man who loved pleasure so as to be very unwilling to part with it might with the assistance of his fancy which doth not grow old so fast reserve some supplemental entertainments that might make their personal service be still of use to him the definition of pleasure is what pleaseth and if that which grave men may call a corrupted fancy shall administer any remedies for putting off mourning for the loss of youth who shall blame it the young men seldom apply their censure to these matters and the elder have an interest to be gentle towards a mistake that seemeth to make some kind of amends for their decays he had wit enough to suspect and he had wit enough too not to care the ladies got a great deal more than would have been allowed to be an equal bargain in chancery for what they did for it but neither the manner nor the measure of pleasure is to be judged by others 
little inducements at first grew into strong reasons by degrees men who do not consider circumstances but judge at a distance by a general way of arguing conclude if a mistress in some cases is not immediately turned off it must needs be that the gallant is incurably subjected this will by no means hold in private men much less in princes who are under more entanglements from which they cannot so easily loosen themselves his mistresses were as different in their humors as they were in their looks they gave matter of very different reflections the last note one the duchess of portsmouth especially was quite out of the definition of an ordinary mistress the causes and the manner of her being first introduced were very different a very peculiar distinction was spoken of some extraordinary solemnities that might dignify though not sanctify her function her chamber was the true cabinet council the king did always by his counsels as he did sometimes by his meals he sat down out of form with the queen but he supped below stairs to have the secrets of a king who happens to have too many is to have a king in chains he must not only not part with her but he must in his own defence dissemble his dislike the less kindness he hath the more he must show there is great difference between being muffled and being tied he was the first not the last if he had quarrelled at some times besides other advantages this mistress had a powerful second one may suppose a kind of a guarantee this to a man that loved his ease though his age had not helped was sufficient the thing called sauntering is a stronger temptation to princes than it is to others the being galled with importunities pursued from one room to another with asking faces the dismal sound of unreasonable complaints and ill-grounded pretenses the deformity of fraud ill disguised all these would make any man run away from them and i used to think it was the motive for making him walk so fast so it was more probably taking sanctuary to get into a room where all business was to stay at the door excepting much as he was disposed to admit might be very acceptable to a younger man than he was and less given to his ease he slumbered after dinner had the noise of the company to divert him without their solicitations to importune him in these hours where he was more unguarded no doubt the cunning men of the court took their times to make their observations and there is as little doubt but he made his upon them too where men had chinks he would see through them as soon as any man about him there was much more real business done there in his politic than there was in his personal capacity stands pede in uno and there was the french part of the government which was not the least in short without endeavouring to find more arguments he was used to it men do not care to put off a habit nor do often succeed when they go about it his was not an unthinkingness he did not perhaps think so much of his subjects as they might wish but he was far from being wanting to think of himself four his conduct to his ministers he lived with his ministers as he did with his mistresses he used them but he was not in love with them he showed his judgment in this that he cannot properly be said ever to have had a favorite though some might look so at a distance the present use he might have of them made him throw favors upon them which might lead the lookers-on into that mistake but he tied himself no more to them than they did to him which implied a sufficient liberty on either side perhaps he made dear purchases if he seldom gave profusely but where he expected some unreasonable thing great rewards were material evidences against those who received them he was free of access to them which was a very gaining quality he had at least as good a memory for the faults of his ministers as for their services and whenever they fell the whole inventory came out there was not a slip omitted that some of his ministers seemed to have a superiority did not spring from his resignation to them 
but to his ease he chose rather to be eclipsed than to be troubled his brother was a minister and he had his jealousies of him at the same time that he raised him he was not displeased to have him lessened the cunning observers found this out and at the same time that he reigned in the cabinet he was very familiarly used at the private supper a minister turned off is like a lady's waiting woman that knoweth all her washes and hath a shrewd guess at her stayings so there is danger in turning them off as well as in keeping them he had back stairs to convey informations to him as well as for other uses and though such informations are sometimes dangerous especially to a prince that will not take the pains necessary to digest them yet in the main that humor of hearing every body against anybody kept those about him in more awe than they would have been without it i do not believe that ever he trusted any man or any set of men so entirely as not to have some secrets in which they had no share as this might make him less well served so in some degree it might make him the less imposed upon you may reckon under this article his female ministry for though he had ministers of the council ministers of the cabinet and ministers of the ruelle the ruelle was often the last appeal those who were not well there were used because they were necessary at the time not because they were liked so that their tenure was a little uncertain his ministers were to administer business to him as doctors do physic wrap it up in something to make it less unpleasant some skilful digressions were so far from being impertinent that they could not many times fix him to a fair audience without them his aversion to formality made him dislike a serious discourse if very long except it was mixed with something to entertain him some even of the graver sort too used to carry this very far and rather than fail use the coarsest kind of youthful talk in general he was upon pretty even terms with his ministers and could as easily bear their being hanged as some of them could his being abused five of his wit and conversation his wit consisted chiefly in the quickness of his apprehension his apprehension made him find faults and that led him to short sayings upon them not always equal but often very good by his being abroad he contracted a habit of conversing familiarly which added to his natural genius made him very apt to talk perhaps more than a very nice judgment would approve he was apt to make broad allusions upon anything that gave the least occasion than was altogether suitable with the very good breeding he showed in most other things the company he kept whilst abroad had so used him to that sort of dialect that he was so far from thinking it a fault or an indecency that he made it a matter of raillery upon those who could not prevail upon themselves to join in it as a man who hath a good stomach loveth generally to talk of meat so in the vigour of his age he began that style which by degrees grew so natural to him that after he ceased to do it out of pleasure he continued to do it out of custom the hypocrisy of the former times inclined men to think they could not show too great an aversion to it and that helped to encourage this unbounded liberty of talking without the restraints of decency which were before observed in his more familiar conversations with the ladies even they must be passive if they would not enter into it how far sounds as well as objects may have their effects to raise inclination might be an argument to him to use that style or whether using liberty at its full stretch was not the general inducement without any particular motives to it the manner of that time of telling stories had drawn him into it being commended at first for the faculty of telling a tale well he might insensibly be betrayed to exercise it too often stories are dangerous in this that the best expose a man most by being oftenest repeated it might pass for an evidence for the moderns against the ancients 
that it is now wholly left off by all that have any pretense to be distinguished by their good sense he had the improvements of wine etc which made him pleasant and easy in company where he bore his part and was acceptable even to those who had no other design than to be merry with him the thing called wit a prince may taste but it is dangerous for him to take too much of it it hath allurements which by refining his thoughts take off from their dignity in applying them less to the governing part there is a charm in wit which a prince must resist and that to him was no easy matter it was contesting with nature upon terms of disadvantage his wit was not so ill-natured as to put men out of countenance in the case of a king especially it is more allowable to speak sharply of them than to them his wit was not acquired by reading that which he had above his original stock by nature was from company in which he was very capable to observe he could not so properly be said to have a wit very much raised as a plain gaining well-bred recommending kind of wit but of all men that ever liked those who had wit he could the best endure those who had none this leaneth more towards a satire than a compliment in this respect that he could not only suffer impertinence but at some times seemed to be pleased with it he encouraged some to talk a good deal more with him than one would have expected from a man of so good a taste he should rather have ordered his attorney-general to prosecute them for a misdemeanor in using common sense so scurvily in his presence however if this was a fault it is arrogant for any of his subjects to object to it since it would look like defying such a piece of indulgence he must in some degree loosen the strength of his wit by his condescension to talk with men so very unequal to him wit must be used to some equality which may give it exercise or else it is apt either to languish or to grow a little vulgar by reigning amongst men of a lower size where there is no awe to keep a man upon his guard it fell out rather by accident than choice that his mistresses were such as did not care that wit of the best kind should have the precedence in their apartments sharp and strong wit will not always be so held in by good manners as not to be a little troublesome in a ruelle but wherever impertinence hath wit enough left to be thankful for being well used it will not only be admitted but kindly received such charms every thing hath that setteth us off by comparison his affability was a part and perhaps not the least of his wit it is a quality that must not always spring from the heart men's pride as well as their weakness maketh them ready to be deceived by it they are more ready to believe it a homage paid to their merit than a bait thrown out to deceive them princes have a particular advantage there was at first as much of art as nature in his affability but by habit it became natural it is an error of the better hand but the universality taketh away a good deal of the force of it a man that hath had a kind look seconded with engaging words whilst he is chewing the pleasure if another in his sight should be received just as kindly that equality would presently alter the relish the pride of mankind will have distinction till at last it cometh to smile for smile meaning nothing of either side without any kind of effect mere drawing-room compliments the bow alone would be better without them he was under some disadvantages of this kind that grew still in proportion as it came by time to be more known that there was less signification in those things than at first was thought the familiarity of his wit must needs have the effect of lessening the distance fit to be kept to him the freedom used to him whilst abroad was retained by those who used it longer than either they ought to have kept it or he have suffered it and others by their example learned to use the same a king of spain that will say nothing but tiendro cuidado will to the generality preserve more respect 
an engine that will speak but sometimes at the same time that it will draw the raillery of the few who judge well it will create respect in the ill-judging generality formality is sufficiently revenged upon the word for being so unreasonably laughed at it is destroyed it is true but it hath the spiteful satisfaction of seeing everything destroyed with it his fine gentlemanship did him no good encouraged in it by being too much applauded his wit was better suited to his condition before he was restored than afterwards the wit of a gentleman and that of a crowned head ought to be different things as there is a crown law there is a crown wit too to use it with reserve is very good and very rare there is a dignity in doing things seldom even without any other circumstance where wit will run continually the spring is apt to fail so that it groweth vulgar and the more it is practised the more it is debased he was so good at finding out other men's weak sides that it made him less intent to cure his own that generally happeneth it may be called a treacherous talent for it betrayeth a man to forget to judge himself by being so eager to censure others this doth so misguide men the first part of their lives that the habit of it is not easily recovered when the greater ripeness of their judgment inclineth them to look more into themselves than into other men men love to see themselves in the false looking-glass of other men's failings it maketh a man think well of himself at the time and by sending his thoughts abroad to get food for laughing they are less at leisure to see faults at home men choose rather to make the war in another country than to keep all well at home six his talents temper habits etc he had a mechanical head which appeared in his inclination to shipping and fortification etc this would make one conclude that his thoughts would naturally have been more fixed to business if his pleasures had not drawn them away from it he had a very good memory though he would not always make equal good use of it so that if he had accustomed himself to direct his faculties to his business i see no reason why he might not have been a good deal master of it his chain of memory was longer than his chain of thought the first could bear any burden the other was tired of being carried on too long it was fit to ride a heat but it had not wind enough for a long course a very great memory often forgetteth how much time is lost by repeating things of no use it was one reason of his talking so much since a great memory will always have something to say and will be discharging itself whether in or out of season if a good judgment doth not go along with it to make it stop and turn one might say of his memory that it was a beauté journaliere sometimes he would make shrewd applications etc at others he would bring things out of it that never deserved to be laid in it he grew by age into a pretty exact distribution of his hours both for his business pleasures and the exercise for his health of which he took as much care as could possibly consist with some liberties he was resolved to indulge in himself he walked by his watch and when he pulled it out to look upon it skilful men would make haste with what they had to say to him he was often retained in his personal against his politic capacity he would speak upon those occasions most dexterously against himself charles stuart would be bribed against the king and in the distinction he leaned more to his natural self than his character would allow he would not suffer himself to be so much fettered by his character as was convenient he was still starting out of it the power of nature was too strong for the dignity of his calling which generally yielded as often as there was a contest it was not the best use he made of his back stairs to admit men to bribe him against himself to procure a defalcation help a lame accountant to get off or side with the farmers against the improvement of the revenue the king was made the instrument to defraud the crown which is somewhat extraordinary that which might tempt him to do it probably was his finding that 
those about him so often took money upon those occasions so that he thought he might do well at least to be a partner he did not take the money to hoard it there were those at court who watched those times as the spaniards do for the coming in for the plate fleet the beggars of whose sexes helped to empty his cabinet and to leave room in them for a new lading upon the next occasion these negotiators played double with him too when it was for their purpose so to do he knew it and went on still so he gained his present end at the end he was less solicitous to inquire into the consequences he could not properly be said to be either covetous or liberal his desire to get was not with an intention to be rich and his spending was rather an easiness in letting money go than any premeditated thought for the distribution of it he would do as much to throw off the burden of a present importunity as he would to relieve a want when once the aversion to bear uneasiness taketh place in a man's mind it doth so check all the passions that they are damped into a kind of indifference they grow faint and languishing and come to be subordinate to that fundamental maxim of not purchasing anything at the price of a difficulty this made that he had as little eagerness to oblige as he had to hurt men the motive of his giving bounties was rather to make men less uneasy to him than more easy to themselves and yet no ill nature all this while he would slide from an asking face and could guess very well it was throwing a man off from his shoulders that leaned upon them with his whole weight so that the party was not gladder to receive than he was to give it was a kind of implied bargain though men seldom kept it being so apt to forget the advantage they had received that they would presume the king would as little remember the good he had done them so as to make it an argument against their next request this principle of making the love of ease exercise an entire sovereignty in his thoughts would have been less censured in a private man than it might be in a prince the consequence of it to the public changeth the nature of that quality or else a philosopher in his private capacity might say a great deal to justify it the truth is a king is to be such a distinct creature from a man that their thoughts are to be put in quite a differing shape and it is such a disquieting task to reconcile them that princes might rather expect to be lamented than to be envied for being in a station that exposeth them if they do not do more to answer men's expectations than human nature will allow that men have the less ease for their loving it so much is so far from a wonder than it is a natural consequence especially in the case of a prince ease is seldom got without some pains but it is yet seldomer kept without them he thought giving would make men more easy to him whereas he might have known it would certainly make them more troublesome when men receive benefits from princes they attribute less to his generosity than to their own deserts so that in their own opinion their merit cannot be bounded by that mistaken rule it can as little be satisfied they would take it for a diminution to have it circumscribed merit hath a thirst upon it that can never be quenched by golden showers it is not only still ready but greedy to receive more this king charles found in as many instances as any prince that ever reigned because the easiness of access introducing the good success of their first request they were the more encouraged to repeat those importunities which had been more effectually stopped in the beginning by a short and resolute denial but his nature did not dispose him to that method it directed him rather to put off the troublesome minute for the time and that being his inclination he did not care to struggle with it i am of an opinion in which i am every day more confirmed by observation that gratitude is one of those things that cannot be bought it must be born with men or else all the obligations in the world will not create it an outward show may be made to satisfy decency and to prevent reproach 
but a real sense of a kind thing is a gift of nature and never was nor can be acquired the love of ease is an opiate it is pleasing for the time quieteth the spirits but it hath its effects that seldom fail to be most fatal the immoderate love of ease maketh a man's mind pay a passive obedience to anything that happeneth it reduceth the thoughts from having desire to be content it must be allowed he had a little overbalance on the well-natured side not vigor enough to be earnest to do a kind thing much less to do a harsh one but if a hard thing was done to another man he did not eat his supper the worse for it it was rather a deadness than severity of nature whether it proceeded from a dissipation of spirits or by the habit of living in which he was engaged if a king should be born with more tenderness than might suit with his office he would in time be hardened the faults of his subjects make severity so necessary that by the frequent occasions given to use it it comes to be habitual and by degrees the resistance that nature made at first groweth fainter till at last it is in a manner quite extinguished in short this prince might more properly be said to have gifts than virtues as affability easiness of living inclinations to give and to forgive qualities that flowed from his nature rather than from his virtue he had not more application to anything than the preservation of his health it had an entire preference to anything else in his thoughts and he might be said without aggravation to study that with as little intermission as any man in the world he understood it very well only in this he failed that he thought it was more reconcilable with his pleasures than it really was it is natural to have such a mind to reconcile these that tis the easier for any man that goeth about it to be guilty of that mistake this made him overdo in point of nourishment the better to furnish to those entertainments and then he thought by great exercise to make amends and to prevent the ill effects of his blood being too much raised the success he had in this method whilst he had youth and vigor to support him in it encouraged him to continue it longer than nature allowed age stealeth so insensibly upon us that we do not think of suiting our way of reasoning to the several stages of life so insensibly that not being able to pitch upon any precise time when we cease to be young we either flatter ourselves that we always continue to be so or at least forget how much we are mistaken in it seven conclusion after all this when some rough strokes of the pencil have made several parts of the picture look a little hard it is a justice that would be due to every man much more to a prince to make some amends and to reconcile men as much as may be to it by the last finishing he had as good a claim to a kind interpretation as most men first as a prince living and dead generous and well-bred men will be gentle to them next as an unfortunate prince in the beginning of his time and a gentle one in the rest a prince neither sharpened by his misfortunes whilst abroad nor by his power when restored is such a shining character that it is a reproach not to be so dazzled with it as not to be able to see a fault in its full light it would be a scandal in this case to have an exact memory and if all who are akin to his vices should mourn for him never prince would be better attended to his grave he is under the protection of common frailty that must engage men for their own sakes not to be too severe where they themselves have so much to answer what therefore an angry philosopher would call lewdness let frailer men call a warmth and sweetness of the blood that would not be confined in the communicating itself an overflowing of good nature of which he had such a stream that it would not be restrained within the banks of a crabbed and unsociable virtue if he had sometimes less firmness than might have been wished let the kindest reason be given and if that should be wanting the best excuse i would assign the cause of it to be his loving at any rate to be easy 
and his deserving the more to be indulged in it by his desiring that everybody else should be so if he sometimes let a servant fall let it be examined whether he did not weigh so much upon his master as to give him a fair excuse that yieldingness whatever foundations it might lay to the disadvantage of posterity was a specific to preserve us in peace for his own time if he loved too much to lie upon his own down bed of ease his subjects had the pleasure during his reign of lolling and stretching upon theirs as a sword is sooner broken upon a feather bed than upon a table so his pliantness broke the blow of a present mischief much better than a more immediate resistance would perhaps have done ruin saw this and therefore removed him first to make way for further overturnings if he dissembled let us remember first that he was a king and that dissimulation is a jewel of the crown next that it is very hard for a man not to do sometimes too much of that which he concludeth necessary for him to practise men should consider that as there would be no false dice if there were no true ones so if dissembling is grown universal it ceaseth to be foul play having an implied allowance by the general practice he that was so often forced to dissemble in his own defence might the better have the privilege sometimes to be the aggressor and to deal with men at their own weapon subjects are apt to be as arbitrary in their censure as the most assuming kings can be in their power if there might be matter for objections there is not less reason for excuses the defects laid to his charge are such as may claim indulgence from mankind should nobody throw a stone at his faults but those who are free from them there would be but a slender shower what private man will throw stones at him because he loved or what prince because he dissembled if he either trusted or forgave his enemies or in some cases neglected his friends more than could in strictness be allowed let not those errors be so arraigned as take away the privilege that seemeth to be due to princely frailties if princes are under the misfortune of being accused to govern ill their subjects have the less right to fall hard upon them since they generally so little deserve to be governed well the truth is the calling of a king with all its glittering hath such an unreasonable weight upon it that they may rather expect to be lamented than to be envied for being set upon a pinnacle where they are exposed to censure if they do not do more to answer men's expectations than corrupted nature will allow it is but justice therefore to this prince to give all due softenings to the less shining parts of his life to offer flowers and leaves to hide instead of using aggravations to expose them let his royal ashes then lie soft upon him and cover him from harsh and unkind censures which though they should not be unjust can never clear themselves from being indecent end of section twenty two a character of king charles the second read by john greenman this is section twenty three of the complete works of george savile first marquis of halifax this librivox recording is in the public domain political thoughts and reflections read by john greenman of fundamentals every party when they find a maxim for their turn they presently call it a fundamental they think they nail it with a peg of iron whereas in truth they only tie it with a wisp of straw the word soundeth so well that the impropriety of it hath been the less observed but as weighty as the word appeareth no feather hath been more blown about in the world than this word fundamental it is one of those mistakes that it sometimes may be of use but it is a mistake still fundamental is used as men use their friends commend them when they have need of them and when they fall out find a hundred objections to them 
fundamental is a pedestal that men set everything upon that they would not have broken it is a nail every body would use to fix that which is good for them for all men would have that principle to be immovable that serves their use at the time everything that is created is mortal ergo all fundamentals of human creation will die a true fundamental must be like the foundation of a house if it is undermined the whole house falleth the fundamentals in divinity have been changed in several ages of the world they have made no difficulty in the several councils to destroy and excommunicate men for asserting things that at other times were called fundamentals philosophy astronomy etc have changed their fundamentals as the men of art no doubt called them at the time motion of the earth etc even in morality one may more properly say there should be fundamentals allowed than that there are any which in strictness can be maintained however this is the least uncertain foundation fundamental is less improperly applied here than anywhere else wise and good men will in all ages stick to some fundamentals look upon them as sacred and preserve an inviolable respect for them but mankind in general make morality a more malleable thing than it ought to be there is then no certain fundamental but in nature and yet there are objections too it is a fundamental in nature that the son should not kill the father and yet the senate of venice gave a reward to a son who brought in his father's head according to a proclamation salus populi is an unwritten law yet that doth not hinder but that it is sometimes very visible and as often as it is so it supersedeth all other laws which are subordinate things compared the great punishments upon self-murder are arguments that it was rather a tempting sin to be discouraged than an unnatural act it is a fundamental that where a man intendeth no hurt he should receive none yet manslaughter etc are cases of mercy that a boy under ten shall not suffer death yet where malicia suplet etatem otherwise that there were witches much shaken of late that the king is not to be deceived in his grant the practical fundamental the contrary that what is given to god cannot be alienated yet in practice it is by treaties etc and even by the church itself when they get a better bargain by it i can make no other definition of a true fundamental than this viz that whatever a man hath a desire to do or to hinder if he hath uncontested and irresistible power to effect it that he will certainly do it if he thinketh he hath that power though he hath it not he will certainly go about it some would define a fundamental to be the settling the laws of nature and common equity in such a sort as that they may be well administered even in this case there can be nothing fixed but it must vary for the good of the whole a constitution cannot make itself somebody made it not at once but at several times it is alterable and by that draweth nearer perfection and without suiting itself to differing times and circumstances it could not live its life is prolonged by changing seasonably the several parts of it at several times the reverence that is given to a fundamental in a general unintelligible notion would be much better applied to that supremacy or power which is set up in every nation in differing shapes that altereth the constitution as often as the good of the people requireth it neither king nor people would now like just the original constitution without any varyings if kings are only answerable to god that doth not secure them even in this world since if god upon the appeal thinketh fit not to stay he maketh the people his instruments i am persuaded that wherever any single man had power to do himself right upon a deceitful trustee he would do it 
that thought well digested would go a great way towards the discouraging invasions upon rights etc i lay down then as a fundamental first that in every constitution there is some power which neither will nor ought to be bounded two that the king's prerogative should be as plain a thing as the people's obedience three that a power which may by parity of reason destroy the whole laws can never be reserved by the laws four that in all limited governments it must give the governor power to hurt but it can never be so interpreted as to give him power to destroy for then in effect it would cease to be a limited government five that severity be rare and great for as tacitus saith of nero quote, frequent punishments made the people call even his justice cruelty unquote. six that it is necessary to make the instruments of power easy for power is hard enough to be digested by those under it at the best seven that the people are never so perfectly backed but that they will kick and fling if not stroked at seasonable times eight that a prince must think if he loseth his people he can never regain them it is both wise and safe to think so nine that kings assuming prerogative teach the people to do so too ten that prerogative is a trust eleven that they are not the king's laws nor the parliament's laws but the laws of england in which after they have passed by the legislative power the people have the property and the king the executive part twelve that no abilities should qualify a noted knave to be employed in business a knave can by none of his dexterities make amends for the scandal he bringeth upon the crown thirteen that those who will not be bound by the laws rely upon crimes a third way was never found in the world to secure any government fourteen that a seaman be a seaman a cabinet councillor a man of business an officer an officer fifteen in corrupted governments the place is given for the sake of the man in good ones the man is chosen for the sake of the place sixteen that crowds at court are made up of such as would deceive the real worshippers are few seventeen that salus populi is the greatest of all fundamentals yet not altogether an immovable one it is a fundamental for a ship to ride at anchor when it is in port but if a storm cometh the cable must be cut eighteen property is not a fundamental right in one sense because in the beginning of the world there was none so that property itself was an innovation introduced by laws property is only secured by trusting it in the best hands and those are generally chosen who are least likely to deceive but if they should they have a legal authority to abuse as well as use the power with which they are trusted and there is no fundamental can stand in their way or be allowed as an exception to the authority that was vested in them nineteen magna carta would fain be made to pass for a fundamental and sir edward coke would have it that the grand charter was for the most part declaratory of the principal grounds of the fundamental laws of england if that refers to the common law it must be made out that everything in magna carta is always and at all times necessary in itself to be kept or else the denying a subsequent parliament the right of repealing any law doth by consequence deny the preceding parliament the right of making it but they are fain to say it was only a declarative law which is very hard to be proved yet suppose it you must either make the common law so stated a thing that all men know it beforehand or else universally acquiesce in it whenever it is alleged from the affinity it hath to the law of nature now i would fain know whether the common law is capable of being defined and whether it does not hover in the clouds like the prerogative and bolteth out like lightning to be made use of for some particular occasion if so 
the government of the world is left to a thing that cannot be defined and if it cannot be defined you know not what it is so that the supreme appeal is we know not what we submit to god almighty though he is incomprehensible and yet he hath set down his methods but for this world there can be no government without a stated rule and a supreme power not to be controlled neither by the dead nor the living the laws under the protection of the king govern in the ordinary administration the extraordinary power is in the acts of parliament from whence there can be no appeal but to the same power at another time to say a power is supreme and not arbitrary is not sense it is acknowledged supreme and therefore etc if the common law is supreme then those are so who judge what is the common law and if none but the parliament can judge so there is an end of the controversy there is no fundamental for the parliament may judge as they please that is they have the authority but they may judge against right their power is good though their act is ill no good man will outwardly resist the one or inwardly approve the other there is then no other fundamental but that every supreme power must be arbitrary fundamental is a word used by the laity as the word sacred is by the clergy to fix everything to themselves they have a mind to keep that nobody else may touch it of princes a prince who will not undergo the difficulty of understanding must undergo the danger of trusting a wise prince may gain such an influence that his countenance would be the last appeal where it is not so in some degree his authority is precarious a prince must keep up the power of his countenance which is not the least of his prerogatives the conscience as well as the prerogative of a king must be restrained or loosened as is best for his people it may without scandal be made of stretching leather but it must be drawn by a steady hand a king that lets intercession prevail will not be long worshipped a prince used to war getteth a military logic that is not very well suited to the civil administration if he maketh war successfully he groweth into a demigod if without success the world throweth him as much below humanity as they had before set him above it a hero must be sometimes allowed to make bold strokes without being fettered by strict reason he is to have some generous irregularities in his reasoning or else he will not be a good thing of his kind princes their rewards of servants when a prince giveth any man a very extravagant reward it looketh as if it was rather for an ill thing than a good one both the giver and receiver are out of countenance where they are ill suited and ill applied serving princes will make men proud at first and humble at last resolving to serve well and at the same time resolving to please is generally resolving to do what is not to be done a man that will serve well must often rule the master so hard that it will hurt him it is thought an unsociable quality in a court to do one's duty better than other men nothing is less forgiven than setting patterns men have no mind to follow men are so unwilling to displease a prince that it is as dangerous to inform him right as to serve him wrong where men get by pleasing and lose by serving the choice is so easy that nobody can miss it princes their secrets men are so proud of prince secrets that they will not see the danger of them when a prince trusteth a man with a dangerous secret he would not be sorry to hear the bell tolled for him love of the subjects to a prince the heart of the subjects yieldeth but a lean crop where it is not cultivated by a wise prince the good will of the governed will be starved if it is not fed by the good conduct of the governors suffering for princes 
those who merit because they suffered are so very angry with those that made them suffer that though their services may deserve employment their temper rendereth them unfit for it of ministers the world dealeth with ministers of state as they do with ill fiddlers ready to kick them downstairs for playing ill though few of the fault-finders understand their music enough to be good judges a minister who undertaketh to make his master very great if he faileth is ruined for his folly if he succeedeth he is feared for his skill a good statesman may sometimes mistake as much by being too humble as by being too proud he must take upon him in order to do his duty and not in order to the setting himself out a minister is not to plead the king's command for such things as he may in justice be supposed to have directed it is dangerous to serve where the master hath the privilege not to be blamed it is hard for a prince to esteem the parts of a minister without either envying or fearing them and less dangerous for a minister to show all the weakness than all the strength of his understanding there are so many things necessary to make up a good minister that no wonder there are so few of them in the world there is hardly a rasher thing than for a man to venture to be a good minister a minister of state must have a spirit of liberal economy not a restrained frugality he must enlarge his family soul and suit it to the bigger compass of a kingdom a prince should be asked why he will do a thing but not why he hath done it if the boys were to choose a schoolmaster it should be one that would not whip them the same thing if the courtiers were to choose a minister they would have a great many play-days no rods and leave to rob orchards the parallel will hold wicked ministers a cunning minister will engage his master to begin with a small wrong step which will insensibly engage him in a great one a man that hath the patience to go by steps may deceive one much wiser than himself state business is a cruel trade good nature is a bungler in it instruments of state ministers men in business are in as much danger from those that work under them as from those that work against them when the instruments bend under the weight of their business it is like a weak-legged horse that brings his rider down with him as when they are too weak they let a man fall so when they are too strong they throw him off if men of business did not forget how apt their tools are to break or fail they would shut up shop they must use things called men under them who will spoil the best scheme that can be drawn by human understanding tools that are blunt cannot cut at all and those that are sharp are apt to cut in the wrong place great difference between a good tool and a good workman when the tools will be workmen they cut their own fingers and everybody's else of the people there is more strength in union than in number witness the people that in all ages have been scurvily used because they could so seldom agree to do themselves right the more the weaker may be as good a proverb as the more the merrier a people can no more stand without government than a child can go without leading strings as old and as big as a nation is it can't go by itself and must be led the numbers that make its strength are at the same time the cause of its weakness and incapacity of acting men have so discovered themselves to one another that union is become a mere word in reality impracticable they trust or suspect not upon reason but ill-grounded fame they should be at ease saved protected etc and give nothing for it the lower sort of men must be indulged the consolation of finding fault with those above them without that they would be so melancholy that it would be dangerous considering their numbers 
they are too many to be told of their mistakes and for that reason they are never to be cured of them the body of the people are generally either so dead that they cannot move or so mad that they cannot be reclaimed to be neither all in a flame nor quite cold requireth more reason than great numbers can ever attain the people can seldom agree to move together against a government but they can to sit still and let it be undone those that will be martyrs for the people must expect to be repaid only by their vanity or their virtue a man that will head the mob is like a bull let loose tied about with squibs and crackers he must be half mad that goeth about it yet at some times shall be too hard for all the wise men in a kingdom for though good sense speaketh against madness yet it is out of countenance whenever it meets it it would be a greater reproach to the people that their favor is short-lived if their malice was not so too the thoughts of the people have no regular motion they come out by starts there is an accumulative cruelty in a number of men though none in particular are ill-natured the angry buzz of a multitude is one of the bloodiest noises in the world of government an exact administration and a good choice of proper instruments doth insensibly make the government in a manner absolute without assuming it the best definition of the best government is that it hath no inconveniences but such as are supportable but inconveniences there must be the interest of the governors and the governed is in reality the same but by mistakes on both sides it is generally very differing he who is a courtier by trade and by the country gentleman who will be popular right or wrong help to keep up this unreasonable distinction there are as many apt to be angry at being well as at being ill-governed for most men to be well governed must be scurvily used as mankind is made the keeping it in order is an ill-natured office it is like a great gallery where the officers must be whipping with little intermission if they will do their duty it is a disorderly government as in a river the lightest things swim at the top a nation is best to be judged by the government it is under at the time mankind is moulded to good or ill according as the power over it is well or ill directed a nation is a mass of dough it is the government that kneadeth it into form where learning and trade flourish in a nation they produce so much knowledge and that so much equality among men that the greatness of dependencies is lost but the nation in general will be the better for it for if the government be wise it is the more easily governed if not the bad government is the more easily overturned by men's being more united against it than when they depended upon great men who might sooner be gained over and weakened by being divided there is more reason for allowing luxury in a military government than in another the perpetual exercise of war not only excuseth but recommendeth the entertainments in the winter in another it groweth into a habit of uninterrupted expenses and idle follies and the consequences of them to a nation become irrecoverable clergy if the clergy did not live like temporal men all the power of princes could not bring them under the temporal jurisdiction they who may be said to be of god almighty's household should show by their lives that he hath a well-disciplined family the clergy in this sense of divine institution that god hath made mankind so weak that it must be deceived religion it is a strange thing that the way to save men's souls should be such a cunning trade as to require a skilful master the time spent in praying to god might be better employed in deserving well from him men think praying the easier task of the two and therefore choose it the people would not believe in god at all if they were not permitted to believe wrong in him 
the several sorts of religion in the world are little more than so many spiritual monopolies if their interests could be reconciled their opinions would be so too men pretend to serve god almighty who doth not need it but make use of him because they need him factions are like pirates that set out false colors when they come near a booty religion is put under deck most men's anger about religion is as if two men should quarrel for a lady they neither of them care for of prerogative power and liberty a prerogative that tendeth to the dissolution of all laws must be void in itself felo de se, for a prerogative is a law the reason of any law is that no man's will should be a law the king is the life of the law and cannot have a prerogative that is mortal to it the law is to have a soul in it or it is a dead thing the king is by his sovereign power to add warmth and vigor to the meaning of the law we are by no means to imagine there is such an antipathy between them that the prerogative like a basilisk is to kill the law whenever it looks upon it the prince hath very rarely use of his prerogative but hath constantly a great advantage by the laws they attribute to the pope indeed that all the laws of the church are in his breast but then he hath the holy ghost for his learned counsel etc the people's obedience must be plain and without evasions the prince's prerogative should be so too king charles i made this answer to the petition of right to the observation whereof he held himself obliged in conscience as well as of his prerogative Quote, that the people's liberties strengthen the king's prerogative and the king's prerogative is to defend the people's liberties Unquote. that princes declarations allow the original of government to come from the people prerogative never yet pretended to repealing the first ground of prerogative was to enable the prince to do good not to do everything if the ground of a king's desire of power be his assurance of himself that he will do no hurt by it is it not an argument for subjects to desire to keep that which they will never abuse it must not be such a prerogative as giveth the government the rickets all the nourishment to go to the upper part and the lower starved as a prince is in danger who calleth a stronger than himself to his assistance so when prerogative useth necessity for an argument it calleth in a stronger thing than itself the same reason may overturn it necessity too is so plain a thing that everybody sees it so that the magistrate hath no great privilege in being the judge of it necessity therefore is a dangerous argument for princes since wherever it is real it constitutes every man a magistrate and gives as great a power of dispensing to every private man as a prince can claim it is not so proper to say that prerogative justifieth force as that force supporteth prerogative they have not been such constant friends but that they have had terrible fallings out all powers are of god and between permission and appointment well considered there is no real difference in a limited monarchy prerogative and liberty are as jealous of one another as any two neighboring states can be of their respective encroachments they ought not to part for small bickerings and must bear little jealousies without breaking for them power is so apt to be insolent and liberty to be saucy that they are very seldom upon good terms they are both so quarrelsome that they will not easily enter into a fair treaty for indeed it is hard to bring them together they ever quarrel at a distance power and liberty are respectively managed in the world in a manner not suitable to their value and dignity they are both so abused that it justifieth the satires that are generally made upon them and they are so in possession of being misapplied that instead of censuring their being abused it is more reasonable to wonder whenever they are not so they are perpetually wrestling and have had their turns when they have been thrown 
to have their bones broken by it. If they were not both apt to be out of breath, there would be no living. If prerogative will urge reason to support it, it must bear reason when it resisteth it. It is a diminution instead of a glory to be above treating upon equal terms with reason. If the people were designed to be the sole property of the supreme magistrate, sure God would have made them of a differing and subordinate species, as he hath the beasts, that by the inferiority of their nature they might the better submit to the dominion of mankind. If none were to have liberty but those who understand what it is, there would not be many freed men in the world. When the people contend for their liberty, they seldom get anything by their victory but new masters. Liberty can neither be got nor kept but by so much care that mankind generally are unwilling to give the price for it, and therefore in the contest between ease and liberty the first hath generally prevailed. Of laws. Laws are generally not understood by three sorts of persons, viz. by those that make them, by those that execute them, and by those that suffer if they break them. Men seldom understand any laws but those they feel. Precepts, like fomentations, must be rubbed into us, and with a rough hand, too. If the laws could speak for themselves, they would complain of the lawyers in the first place. There is more learning now required to explain a law made than went to the making it. The law hath so many contradictions and varyings from itself that the law may not improperly be called a law-breaker. It is become too changeable a thing to be defined. It is made little less a mystery than the gospel. The clergy and the lawyers, like the Freemasons, may be supposed to take an oath not to tell the secret. The men of law have a bias to their calling in the interpretations they make of the law. Of Parliaments The Parliaments are so altered from their original constitution that between the court and the country the house, instead of being united, is like troops of a contrary party facing one another and watching their advantage. Even the well-meaning men, who have good sense, too, have their difficulties in an assembly. What they offer honestly for a good end will be skillfully improved for an ill one. It is strange that a gross mistake should live a minute in an assembly. One would expect that it should be immediately stifled by their discerning faculties. But practice convinceth that a mistake is nowhere better entertained. In parliaments men wrangle in behalf of liberty, that do as little care for it as they deserve it. Where the people in parliament give a good deal of money in exchange for anything from the crown, a wise prince can hardly have an ill bargain. The present gift begetteth more. It is a politic kind of generation, and whenever a parliament doth not bring forth, it is the unskilfulness of the government that is the cause of the miscarriage. Parliaments would bind and limit one another, and enact that such and such things shall not be made precedents. There is not a word of sense in this language, which yet is to be understood the sense of the nation, and is printed as solemnly as if it was sense. Of Parties The best party is but a kind of a conspiracy against the rest of the nation. They put everybody else out of their protection like the Jews to the Gentiles, all others are the off-scourings of the world. Men value themselves upon their principles so as to neglect practice, abilities, industry, etc. Party cutteth off one half of the world from the other, so that the mutual improvement of men's understanding by conversing, etc., is lost, and men are half undone when they lose the advantage of knowing what their enemies think of them. It is like faith without works. They take it for a dispensation from all other duties, which is the worst kind of dispensing power. It groweth to be the master thought, the eagerness against one another at home being a nearer object, extinguisheth that which we ought to have against our foreign enemies, 
and few men's understandings can get above overvaluing the danger that is nearest in comparison of that more remote it turneth all thought into talking instead of doing men get a habit of being unuseful to the public by turning in a circle of wrangling and railing which they cannot get out of and it may be remarked that a speculative coxcomb is not only unuseful but mischievous a practical coxcomb under discipline may be made use of it maketh a man thrust his understanding into a corner and confine it till by degrees he destroys it party is generally an effect of wantonness peace and plenty which beget humor pride etc and that is called zeal and public spirit they forget insensibly that there is anybody in the world but themselves by keeping no other company so they miscalculate cruelly and thus parties mistake their strength by the same reason that private men overvalue themselves for we by finding fault with others build up a partial esteem of ourselves upon the foundation of their mistakes so men in parties find faults with those in the administration not without reason but forget that they would be exposed to the same objections and perhaps greater if it was their adversary's turn to have the fault-finding part there are men who shine in a faction and make a figure by opposition who would stand in a worse light if they had the preferments they struggled for it looketh so like courage but nothing that is like is the same to go to the extreme that men are carried away with it and blown up out of their senses by the wind of popular applause that which looketh bold is of a great object that the people can discern but that which is wise is not so easily seen it is one part of it that it is not seen but at the end of a design those who are disposed to be wise too late are apt to be valiant too early most men enter into a party rashly and retreat from it as shamefully as they encourage one another at first so they betray one another at last and because every qualification is capable of being corrupted by the excess they fall upon the extreme to fix mutual reproaches upon one another party is little less than an inquisition where men are under such a discipline in carrying on the common cause as leaves no liberty of private opinion it is hard to produce an instance where a party did ever succeed against a government except they had a good handle given them no original party ever prevailed in a turn it brought up something else but the first projectors were thrown off if there are two parties a man ought to adhere to that which he disliketh least though in the whole he doth not approve it for whilst he doth not list himself in one or the other party he is looked upon as such a straggler that he is fallen upon by both therefore a man under such a misfortune of singularity is neither to provoke the world nor disquiet himself by taking any particular station it becometh him to live in the shade and keep his mistakes from giving offence but if they are his opinions he cannot put them off as he doth his clothes happy those who are convinced so as to be of the general opinions ignorance maketh most men go into party and shame keepeth them from getting out of it more men hurt others they do not know why than for any reason if there was any party entirely composed of honest men it would certainly prevail but both the honest men and the knaves resolve to turn one another off when the business is done they by turns defame all england so nobody can be employed that hath not been branded there are few things so criminal as a place of courts the court may be said to be a company of well-bred fashionable beggars at court if a man hath too much pride to be a creature he hath better stay at home a man who will rise at court must begin by creeping upon all four a place at court like a place in heaven 
is to be got by being much upon one's knees there are hardly two creatures of a more differing species than the same man when he is pretending to a place and when he is in possession of it men's industry is spent in receiving the rents of a place there is little left for discharging the duty of it some places have such a corrupting influence upon the man that it is a supernatural thing to resist it some places lie so fair to entertain corruption that it looketh like renouncing a due perquisite not to go into it if a getting fool would keep out of business he would grow richer in a court than a man of sense one would wonder that in a court where there is so little kindness there should be so much whispering men must brag of kind letters from court at the same time that they do not believe one word of them men at court think so much of their own cunning that they forget other men's after a revolution you see the same men in the drawing-room and within a week the same flatterers of punishment wherever a government knows when to show the rod it will not often be put to use it but between the want of skill and the want of honesty faults generally either escape punishment or are mended to no purpose men are not hanged for stealing horses but that horses may not be stolen wherever a knave is not punished an honest man is laughed at a cheat to the public is thought infamous and yet to accuse him is not thought an honorable part what a paradox tis an ill method to make the aggravation of the crime a security against the punishment so that the danger is not to rob but not to rob enough treason must not be inlaid work for several pieces it must be an entire piece of itself a cumulative in that case is a murdering word that carrieth injustice and no sense in it an influence though never so rational should go no farther than to justify a suspicion not so far as to inflict a punishment nothing is so apt to break with stretching as an inference and nothing so ridiculous as to see how fools will abuse one end of political thoughts and reflections read by john greenman this is section 24 of the complete works of george savile first marquis of halifax this librivox recording is in the public domain moral thoughts and reflections read by john greenman of the world it is from the shortness of thought that men imagine there is any great variety in the world time hath thrown a veil upon the faults of former ages or else we should see the same deformities we condemn in the present times when a man looketh upon the rules that are made he will think there can be no faults in the world and when he looketh upon the faults there are so many he will be tempted to think there are no rules they are not to be reconciled otherwise than by concluding that which is called frailty is the incurable nature of mankind a man that understandeth the world must be weary of it and a man who doth not for that reason ought not to be pleased with it the uncertainty of what is to come is such a dark cloud that neither reason nor religion can quite break through it and the condition of mankind is to be weary of what we do know and afraid of what we do not the world is beholden to generous mistakes for the greatest part of the good that is done in it our vices and virtues couple with one another and get children that resemble both their parents if a man can hardly inquire into a thing he undervalueth how can a man of good sense take pains to understand the world to understand the world and to like it are two things not easily to be reconciled 
that which is called an able man is a great overvaluer of the world and all that belongeth to it all that can be said of him is that he maketh the best of the general mistake it is the fools and the knaves that make the wheels of the world turn they are the world those few who have sense or honesty sneak up and down single but never go in herds to be too much troubled is a worse way of overvaluing the world than the being too much pleased a man that steps aside from the world and hath leisure to observe it without interest or design thinks all mankind as mad as they think him for not agreeing with them in their mistakes of ambition the serious folly of wise men in overvaluing the world is as contemptible as anything they think fit to censure the first mistake belonging to business is the going into it men make it such a point of honor to be fit for business that they forget to examine whether business is fit for a man of sense there is reason to think the most celebrated philosophers would have been bunglers at business but the reason is because they despised it it is not a reproach but a compliment to learning to say that great scholars are less fit for business since the truth is business is so much a lower thing than learning that a man used to the last cannot easily bring his stomach down to the first the government of the world is a great thing but it is a very coarse one too compared with the fineness of speculative knowledge the dependence of a great man upon a greater is a subjection that lower men cannot easily comprehend ambition hath no mean it is either upon all four or upon tiptoes nothing can be humbler than ambition when it is so disposed popularity is a crime from the moment it is sought it is only a virtue where men have it whether they will or no it is generally an appeal to the people from the sentence given by men of sense against them it is stepping very low to get very high men by habit make irregular stretches of power without discerning the consequence and extent of them eagerness is apt to overlook consequences it is loath to be stopped in its career for when men are in great haste they see only in a straight line of cunning and knavery cunning is so apt to grow into knavery that an honest man will avoid the temptation of it but men in this age are half bribed by the ambition of circumventing without any other encouragements so proud of the character of being able men that they do not care to have their dexterity confined in this age when it is said of a man he knows how to live it may be implied he is not very honest an honest man must lose so many occasions of getting that the world will hardly allow him the character of an able one there is however more wit requisite to be an honest man than there is to be a knave the most necessary thing in the world and yet the least usual is to reflect that those we deal with may know how to be as arrant knaves as ourselves the eagerness of a knave maketh him often as catchable as ignorance maketh a fool no man is so much a fool as not to have wit enough sometimes to be a knave nor any so cunning a knave as not to have the weakness sometimes to play the fool the mixture of fool and knave maketh up the party-coloured creatures that make all the bustle in the world there is not so pleasant a quarry as a knave taken in a net of his own making a knave leaneth sometimes so hard upon his impudence that it breaketh and lets him fall knavery is in such perpetual motion that it hath not always leisure to look to its own steps tis like sliding upon skates no motion so smooth or swift but none gives so terrible a fall 
a knave loveth self so heartily that he is apt to overstrain it by never thinking he can get enough he gets so much less his thought is like wine that fretteth with too much fermenting the knaves in every government are a kind of corporation and though they fall out with one another like all beasts of prey yet upon occasion they unite to support the common cause it cannot be said to be such a corporation as the bank of england but they are a numerous and formidable body scarce to be resisted but the point is they can never rely upon one another knaves go chained to one another like slaves in the galleys and cannot easily untie themselves from their company their promises and honor indeed do not hinder them but other entangling circumstances keep them from breaking loose if knaves had not foolish memories they would never trust one another so often as they do present interest like present love maketh all other friendship look cold to it but it faileth in the holding when one knave betrayeth another the one is not to be blamed nor the other to be pitied when they complain of one another as if they were honest men they ought to be laughed at as if they were fools there are some cunning men who yet can scarce be called rational creatures yet they are often more successful than men of sense because those they have to deal with are upon a looser guard and their simplicity maketh their knavery unsuspected there is no such thing as a venial sin against morality no such thing as a small knavery he that carries a small crime easily will carry it on when it grows to be an ox but the little knaves are the greater of the two because they have less the excuse of temptation knavery is so humble and merit so proud that the latter is thrown down because it cannot stoop of folly and fools there are five orders of fools as of building one the blockhead two coxcomb three vain blockhead four grave coxcomb and five the half-witted fellow this last is of the composite order the follies of grave men have the precedence of all others a ridiculous dignity that gives them a right to be laughed at in the first place as the masculine wit is the strongest so the masculine impertinence is the greatest the consequence of a half-wit is a half-will there is not strength enough in the thought to carry it to the end a fool is naturally recommended to our kindness by setting us off by the comparison men are grateful to fools for giving them the pleasure of contemning them but folly hath a long tail that is not seen at first for every single folly hath a root out of which more are ready to sprout and a fool hath so unlimited a power of mistaking that a man of sense can never comprehend to what degree it may extend there are some fools so low that they are preferred when they are laughed at their being named putteth them in the list of men which is more than belongeth to them one should no more laugh at a contemptible fool than at a dead fly the dissimulation of a fool should come within the statute of stabbing it giveth no warning a fool will be rude from the moment he is allowed to be familiar he can make no other use of freedom than to be unmannerly weak men are apt to be cruel because they stick at nothing that may repair the ill effect of their mistakes folly is often more cruel in the consequence than malice can be in the intent many a man is murdered by the well-meant mistakes of his unthinking friends a weak friend if he will be kind ought to go no farther than wishes if he proffereth either to say or to do it is dangerous a man had as good go to bed to a razor as to be intimate with a foolish friend mistaken kindness is little less dangerous than premeditated malice 
a man hath not the relief of being angry at the blows of a mistaken friend a busy fool is fitter to be shut up than a downright madman a man that hath only wit enough not to do hurt committeth a sin if he aimeth at doing good his passive understanding must not pretend to be active it is a sin against nature for such a man to be meddling it is hard to find a blockhead so wise as to be upon the defensive he will be sallying and then he is sure to be ill-used if a dull fool can make a vow and keep it never to speak his own sense or do his own business he may pass a great while for a rational creature a blockhead is as ridiculous when he talketh as a goose is when it flieth the grating a gridiron is not a worse noise than the jingling of words is to a man of sense it is ill manners to silence a fool and cruelty to let him go on most men make little other use of their speech than to give evidence against their own understanding a great talker may be a man of sense but he cannot be one who will venture to rely upon him there is so much danger in talking that a man strictly wise can hardly be called a sociable creature the great expense of words is laid out in setting ourselves out or deceiving others to convince them requireth but a few many words are always either suspicious or ridiculous a fool hath no dialogue within himself the first thought carrieth him without the reply of a second a fool will admire or like nothing that he understands a man of sense nothing but what he understands wise men gain and poor men live by the superfluities of fools till follies become ruinous the world is better with than it would be without them a fool is angry that he is the fool of a knave forgetting that it is the end of his creation of hope hope is a kind cheat in the minute of our disappointment we are angry but upon the whole matter there is no pleasure without it it is so much a pleasanter thing than truth to the greatest part of the world that it hath all their kindness the other only hath their respect hope is generally a wrong guide though it is very good company by the way it brusheth through hedge and ditch till it cometh to a great leap and there it is apt to fall and break its bones it would be well if hopes carried men only to the top of the hill without throwing them afterwards down the precipice the hopes of a fool are blind guides those of a man of sense doubt often of their way men should do with their hopes as they do with tame fowl cut their wings that they may not fly over the wall a hoping fool hath such terrible falls that his brains are turned though not cured by them the hopes of a fool are bullets he throws into the air that fall down again and break his skull there can be no entire disappointment to a wise man because he maketh it a cause of succeeding another time a fool is so unreasonably raised by his hopes that he is half dead by a disappointment his mistaken fancy draweth him so high that when he falleth he is sure to break his bones of anger anger is a better sign of the heart than of the head it is a breaking out of the disease of honesty just anger may be as dangerous as it could be if there was no provocation to it for a knave is not so nice a casuist but that he will ruin if he can any man that blameth him where ill nature is not predominant anger will be short breathed it cannot hold out a long course hatred can be tired and cloyed as well as love for our spirits like our limbs are tired with being long in one posture there is a dignity in good sense that is offended and defaced by anger anger is never without an argument but seldom with a good one 
anger raiseth invention but it overheateth the oven anger like drink raiseth a great deal of unmannerly wit true wit must come by drops anger throweth it out in a stream and then it is not likely to be of the best kind ill language punisheth anger by drawing a contempt upon it of apologies it is a dangerous task to answer objections because they are helped by the malice of mankind a bold accusation doth at first draw such a general attention that it gets the world on its side to a man who hath a mind to find a fault an excuse generally giveth farther hold explaining is generally half confessing innocence hath a very short style when a jealousy of any kind is once raised it is as often provoked as cured by any arguments let them be never so reasonable when laziness letteth things alone it is a disease but when skill doth it it is a virtue malice may help a fool to aggravate but there must be skill to know how to extenuate to lessen an object that at the first sight giveth offence requireth a dexterous hand there must be strength as well as skill to take off the weight of the first impression when a man is very unfortunate it looketh like a saucy thing in him to justify himself a man must stoop sometimes to his ill star but he must never lie down to it the vindications men make of themselves to posterity would hardly be supported by good sense if they were not of some advantage to their own families the defending an ill thing is more criminal than the doing it because it wanteth the excuse of its not being premeditated an advocate for injustice is like a bawd that is worse than her client who committeth the sin there is hardly any man so strict as not to vary a little from truth when he is to make an excuse not telling all the truth is hiding it and that is comforting or abetting a lie a long vindication is seldom a skilful one long doth at least imply doubtful in such a case a fool should avoid the making an excuse as much as the committing a fault for a fool's excuse is always a second fault and whenever he will undertake either to hide or mend a thing he proclaimeth and spoileth it of malice and envy malice is a greater magnifying glass than kindness malice is of a low stature but it hath very long arms it often reacheth into the next world death itself is not a bar to it malice like lust when it is at the height doth not know shame if it did not sometimes cut itself with its own edge it would destroy the world malice can mistake by being keen as well as by being dull when malice groweth critical it loseth its credit it must go under the disguise of plainness or else it is exposed anger may have some excuse for being blind but malice none for malice hath time to look before it when malice is overgrown it cometh to be the highest degree of impertinence for that reason it must not be fed and pampered which is apt to make it play the fool but where it is wise and steady there is no precaution that can be quite proof against it ill will is seldom cured on a sudden it must go off by degrees by insensible transpiration malice may be sometimes out of breath envy never a man may make peace with hatred but never with envy no passion is better heard by our will than that of envy no passion is admitted to have audience with less exception envy taketh the shape of flattery and that maketh men hug it so close that they cannot part with it the sure way to be commended is to get into a condition of being pitied 
for envy will not give its leave to commend a man till he is miserable a man is undone when envy will not vouchsafe to look upon him yet after all envy doth virtue as much good as hurt by provoking it to appear nay it forcibly draweth out and inviteth virtue by giving it a mind to be revenged of it of vanity the world is nothing but vanity cut out into several shapes men often mistake themselves but they never forget themselves a man must not so entirely fall out with vanity as not to take its assistance in the doing great things vanity is like some men who are very useful if they are kept under and else not to be endured a little vanity may be allowed in a man's train but it must not sit down at table with him without some share of it men's talents would be buried like ore in a mine unwrought men would be less eager to gain knowledge if they did not hope to set themselves out by it it showeth the narrowness of our nature that a man that intendeth any one thing extremely hath not thought enough left for any thing else our pride maketh us overvalue our stock of thought so as to trade much beyond what it is able to make good many aspire to learn what they can never comprehend as others pretend to teach what they themselves do not know the vanity of teaching often tempteth a man to forget he is a blockhead self-conceit driveth away the suspecting how scurvily others think of us vanity cannot be a friend to truth because it is restrained by it and vanity is so impatiently desirous of showing itself that it cannot bear the being crossed there is a degree of vanity that recommendeth if it goeth further it exposeth so much as to stir the blood to do commendable things but not so much as to possess the brain and turn it round there are as many that are blown up by the wind of vanity as are carried away by the stream of interest everybody hath not wit enough to act out of interest but everybody hath little enough to do it out of vanity some men's heads are as easily blown away as their hats if the commending others well did not recommend ourselves there would be few panegyrics men's vanity will often dispose them to be commended into very troublesome employments the desiring to be remembered when we are dead is to so little purpose that it is fit men should as they generally are be disappointed in it nevertheless the desire of leaving a good name behind us is so honorable to ourselves and so useful to the world that good sense must not be heard against it heraldry is one of those foolish things that may yet be too much despised the contempt of scutcheons is as much a disease in this age as the overvaluing them was in former times there is a good use to be made of the most contemptible things and an ill one of those that are the most valuable of money if men considered how many things there are that riches cannot buy they would not be so fond of them the things to be bought with money are such as least deserve the giving a price for them wit and money are so apt to be abused that men generally make a shift to be the worse for them money in a fool's hand exposeth him worse than a pied coat money hath too great a preference given to it by states as well as by particular men men are more the sinews of war than money the third part of an army must be destroyed before a good one can be made out of it they who are of opinion that money will do everything may very well be suspected to do everything for money false learning a little learning misleadeth and a great deal often stupefieth the understanding great reading without applying it is like corn heaped that is not stirred it groweth musty 
a learned coxcomb dieth his mistakes in so much a deeper color a wrong kind of learning serveth only to embroider his errors a man that hath read without judgment is like a gun charged with goose shot let loose upon the company he is only well furnished with materials to expose himself and to mortify those he liveth with the reading of the greatest scholars if put into a limbeck might be distilled into a small quantity of essence the reading of most men is like a wardrobe of old clothes that are seldom used weak men are the worse for the good sense they read in books because it furnishes them only with more matter to mistake of company men that cannot entertain themselves want somebody though they care for nobody an impertinent fellow is never in the right but in his being weary of himself by that time men are fit for company they see the objections to it the company of a fool is dangerous as well as tedious it is flattering some men to endure them present punishment attendeth the fault a following wit will be welcome in most companies a leading one lieth too heavy for envy to bear outdoing is so near reproaching that it will generally be thought very ill company anything that shineth doth in some measure tarnish everything that standeth next to it keeping much company generally endeth in playing the fool or the knave with them of friendship friendship cometh oftener by chance than by choice which maketh it generally so uncertain it is a mistake to say a friend can be bought a man may buy a good turn but he cannot buy the heart that doth it friendship cannot live with ceremony nor without civility there must be a nice diet observed to keep friendship from falling sick nay there is more skill necessary to keep a friend than there is to reclaim an enemy those friends who are above interest are seldom above jealousy it is a misfortune for a man not to have a friend in the world but for that reason he shall have no enemy in the commerce of the world men struggle little less with their friends than they do with their enemies esteem ought to be the ground of kindness and yet there are no friends that seldomer meet kindness is apt to be as afraid of esteem as that is to be ashamed of kindness our kindness is greatest to those that will do what we would have them in which our esteem cannot always go along end of moral thoughts and reflections read by john greenman This is section 25 of The Complete Works of George Saville, First Marquis of Halifax. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Miscellaneous Thoughts and Reflections Read by John Greenman The rule of doing as we would be done by is never less observed than it is in telling others their faults but men intend more to show others that they are free from the fault than to dissuade them from committing it they are so pleased with the prudent shape of an adviser that it raiseth the value they have of themselves whilst they are about it certainly to give advice to a friend either asked or unasked is so far from a fault that it is a duty but if a man love to give advice it is a sure sign that he himself wanteth it a man whilst he is advising putteth his understanding upon tiptoes and is unwilling to bring it down again a weak man had rather be thought to know than know and that maketh him so impatient to be told of a mistake he who will not be the better for other men's faults hath no cure left for his own but he that can probe himself to cure his own faults will seldom need either the surgery of his friends or of his enemies in a corrupted age the putting the world in order would breed confusion 
a rooted disease must be stroked away rather than kicked away as soon as men have understanding enough to find a fault they have enough to see the danger of mending it desiring to have anything mended is venturing to have it spoiled to know when to let things alone is a high pitch of good sense but a fool hath an eagerness like a monkey in a glass shop to break everything in the handling curing and mending are generally mere words of art not to be relied upon they are set out in bills but the mountbacks only get by them great bashfulness is oftener an effect of pride than of modesty modesty is oftener mistaken than any other virtue wise venturing is the most commendable part of human prudence it is the upper story of prudence whereas perpetual caution is a kind of underground wisdom that doth not care to see the light it is best for great men to shoot over and for lesser men to shoot short men who borrow their opinions can never repay their debts they are beggars by nature and can therefore never get a stock to grow rich upon a man who hath not a distinguishing head is safest by not minding what anybody saith he had better trust to his own opinion than spoil another man's for want of apprehending it it is some kind of scandal not to bear with the faults of an honest man it is not loving honesty enough to allow it distinguishing privileges there are some decent faults which may pretend to be in the lower rank of virtues and surely where honor or gratitude are the motives censure must be a good deal silenced men must be saved in this world by their want of faith a man that getteth care into his thoughts cannot properly be said to trade without a stock care and right thought will produce crops all the year without staying for the seasons a man is to go about his own business as if he had not a friend in the world to help him in it he that relieth upon himself will be oppressed by others with offers of their service all are apt to shrink from those that lean upon them if men would think how often their own words are thrown at their heads they would less often let them go out of their mouths men's words are bullets that their enemies take up and make use of against them a man watches himself best when others watch him too it is as necessary for us to suppress our reason when it offendeth as our mistakes when they expose us in an unreasonable age a man's reason let loose would undo him a wise man will do with his reason as a miser doth with his money hoard it but be very sparing in the expense of it a man that should call everything by its right name would hardly pass the streets without being knocked down as a common enemy a man cannot be more in the wrong than to own without distinction the being in the right when a man is very kind or very angry there is no sure god but silence upon that subject a man's understanding is easily shoved out of its place by warm thoughts of any kind we are not so much masters of our heat as to have enough to warm our thoughts and not so much as to set them on fire a great enemy is a great object that inviteth precaution which maketh him less dangerous than a mean one an old man concludeth from his knowing mankind that they know him too and that maketh him very wary on the other hand it must be allowed that a man's being deceived by knaves hath often this ill effect that it maketh him too jealous of honest men the mind like the body is subject to be hurt by everything it taketh for a remedy there are some such very great foreseers that they grow into the vanity of pretending to see where nothing is to be seen he that will see at too great a distance will sometimes mistake a bush for a horse the prospect of a wise man will be bounded 
a man may so overdo it in looking too far before him that he may stumble the more for it and to conclude he that leaveth nothing to chance will do few things ill but he will do very few things suspicion is rather a virtue than a fault as long as it doth like a dog that watcheth and doth not bite a wise man in trusting another must not rely upon his promise against his nature early suspicion is often an injury and late suspicion is always a folly a wise man will keep his suspicions muzzled but he will keep them awake there can no rules be given to suspicion no more than to love suspicion taketh root and beareth fruit from the moment it is planted suspicion seldom wanteth food to keep it up in health and vigour it feedeth upon everything it seeth and is not curious in its diet suspicion doth not grow up to an injury till it breaketh out when our suspicion of another man is once discovered by him there ought to be an end of all further commerce he that is never suspected is either very much esteemed or very much despised a man's interest is not of sufficient ground to suspect him if his nature doth not concur in it a weak man hath less suspicion than a wise one but when he hath it he is less easily cured the remedies as often increase the disease as they do allay it and a fool valueth himself upon suspecting at a venture many men swallow the being cheated but no man could ever endure to chew it few men would be deceived if their conceit of themselves did not help the skill of those that go about it complaining is a contempt upon one's self it is an ill sign both of a man's head and of his heart a man throweth himself down whilst he complaineth and when a man throweth himself down nobody careth to take him up again content layeth pleasure nay virtue in a slumber with few and faint intermissions it is to the mind like moss to a tree it bindeth it up so as to stop its growth the impudence of a bawd is modesty compared with that of a convert a convert hath so much to do to gain credit that a man is to think well before he changeth men generally state their wants by their fancy and not by their reason the poor young children are whipped and beaten by the old ones who are much more inexcusably impertinent not having things is a more proper expression for a man of sense than his wanting them where sense is wanting everything is wanting a man of sense can hardly want but for his friends and children that have none most men let their wishes run away with them they have no mind to stop them in their career the motion is so pleasing to desire what belongeth to another man is misprision of robbery men are commanded not to covet because when they do they are very apt to take a difficulty raiseth the spirits of a great man he hath a mind to wrestle with it and give it a fall a man's mind must be very low if the difficulty doth not make a part of his pleasure the pride of compassing may more than compare with the pleasure of enjoying nothing so ridiculous as a false philosopher and nothing so rare as a true one men take more pains to hide than to mend themselves men's pride as well as their weakness disposeth them to rely upon dreams from their thinking themselves of such importance as to have warning of what is to befall them the enquiry into a dream is another dream it is a piece of arrogance to dare to be drunk because a man showeth himself without a veil the best way to suppose what may come is to remember what is past the best qualification of a prophet is to have a good memory experience maketh more prophets than revelation 
the knowledge that is got without pains is kept without pleasure the struggling for knowledge hath a pleasure in it like that of wrestling with a fine woman extremity is always ill that which is good cannot live a moment with it anybody that is fool enough will be safe in the world and anybody that can be knave enough will be rich in it the generality of the world falleth into an insufficient mean that exposeth them more than an extreme on either side though memory and invention are not upon good terms yet when the first is loaded the other is stifled the memory hath claws by which it holdeth fast but it hath no wings like the invention to enable it to fly some men's memory is like a box where a man should mingle his jewels with his old shoes there ought to be a great difference between the memory and the stomach the last is to admit everything the former should have the faculty of rejecting it is a nice mean between letting the thought languish for want of exercise and tiring it by giving it too much a man may dwell so long upon a thought that it may take him prisoner the hardest thing in the world is to give the thoughts due liberty and yet retain them in due discipline they are libertines that are apt to abuse freedom and do not well know how to bear restraint a man that excels in any one thing has a kind of arbitrary power over all that hear him upon that subject and no man's life is too short to know any one thing perfectly the modern wit is rather to set men out than to make them of any use some men have acted courage who had it not but no man can act wit if nature doth not teach him his part true wit is always revenged upon any false pretender that meddleth with it wit is the only thing that men are willing to think they can ever have enough of there is a happy pitch of ignorance that a man of sense might pray for a man that hath true wit will have honor too not only to adorn but to support it the building up a family is a manufacture very little above the building a house of cards time and accidents are sure to furnish a blast to blow it down no house wanteth new tiling so often as a family wants repairing the desire of having children is as much the effect of vanity as of good nature we think our children a part of ourselves though as they grow up they might very well undeceive us men love their children not because they are promising plants but because they are theirs they cannot discredit the plant without disparaging the soil out of which it came pride in this as in many other things is often mistaken for love as children make a man poor in one sense so in another they enforce care and that begetteth riches love is presently out of breath when it is to go up hill from the children to the parents tis good to have men in awe but dangerous to have them afraid of us the mean is so nice that the hitting upon it is oftener the effect of chance than of skill a degree of fear sharpeneth the excess of it stupefieth it is as scandalous not to fear at some times as it can be to be afraid at others folly begets want and want flattery so that flattery with all its wit is the grandchild of folly were it not for bunglers in the manner of doing it hardly any man would ever find out he was laughed at and yet generally speaking a trowel is a more effectual instrument than a pencil for flattery men generally do so love the taste of flattery their stomach can never be overcharged with it there is a right reverend flattery that hath the precedence of all other kinds of it this mitred flattery is of all others the most exalted 
it ever groweth in proportion and keepeth pace with power there is a noble stroke of it in the article sent to princess mary from henry the eighth such is his majesty's gracious and divine nature showing mercy to such as repentantly cry and call for the same unquote. forgetting is oftener an aggravation than an excuse the memory will seldom be unmannerly but where it is unkind there needeth little care to polish the understanding if true means were used to strengthen it it will polish itself good manners is such a part of good sense that they cannot be divided but that which a fool calleth good breeding is the most unmannerly thing in the world right good manners require so much sense that there is hardly any such thing in the world good nature is rather acted than practised in the world good nature to others is an inseparable part of justice good will like grace floweth where it listeth men mean so very well to themselves that they forget to mean well to anybody else good sense will allow of some intermitting fevers but then the fit must be short he that can be quite indifferent when he seeth another man injured hath a lukewarm honesty that a wise man will not depend upon he that is not concerned when he seeth an ill thing done to another will not be very eager to do a good one himself there is so much wit necessary to make a skilful hypocrite that the faculty is fallen amongst bunglers who make it ridiculous an injury may more properly be said to be postponed than to be forgiven the memory of it is never so subdued but that it hath always life in it the memory of an enemy admitteth no decay but age could we know what men are most apt to remember we might know what they are most apt to do it is a general fault that we dislike men only for the injuries they do to us and not for those they do to mankind yet it will be hard to give a good reason why a man who hath done a deliberate injury to one will not do it to another the memory and the conscience never did nor never will agree about forgiving injuries nature is second to the memory and religion to the conscience when the seconds fight the latter is generally disarmed a man in a corrupted age must make a secret of his integrity or else he will be looked upon as a common enemy he must engage his friends not to speak of it for he setteth himself for a mark to be ill-used as far as keeping distance is a sign of respect mankind hath a great deal for justice they make up in ceremony what they want in good will to it where the generality are offenders justice cometh to be cruelty to love and to be in love with anything are things as differing as good sense and impertinence when we once go beyond bare liking we are in danger of parting with good sense and it is not easy for good sense to get so far as liking when by habit a man cometh to have a bargaining soul its wings are cut so that it can never soar it bindeth reason an apprentice to gain and instead of a director maketh it a drudge the being kind to a liar is abetting a treason against mankind a man is to inform the first magistrate that he may be clapped up lies are embroidered with promises and excuses a known liar should be outlawed in a well-ordered government a man that renounceth truth runneth away from his trial in the world the use of talking is almost lost in the world by the habit of lying a man that doth not tell all the truth ought to be hanged for a clipper half the truth is often as errant a lie as can be made it is the more dexterous but not the less criminal kind of lying names to men of sense are no more than fig leaves to the generality they are thick coverings that hide the nature of things from them 
fools turn good sense upon its head they take names for things and things only for names it is a general mistake to think the men we like are good for everything and those we do not good for nothing a man who is master of patience is master of everything else he that can tell how to bear in the right place is master of everybody he dealeth with positive is the perfection of coxcomb he is then come to his full growth it showeth men's nature that when they are pampered in any kind they are very apt to play jadish tricks one of the tricks of any creature that is wanton is to kick what is next them everything that doth us good is so apt to do us hurt too that it is a strong argument for men to be quiet if men would think more they would act less the greatest part of the business of the world is the effect of not thinking most men put their reason out to service to their will the master and the man are perpetually falling out a third man will hazard a beating if he goes about to part them nothing hath an uglier look to us than reason when it is not of our side we quarrel so often with it that it maketh us afraid to come near it a man that doth not use his reason is a tame beast a man that abuses it is a wild one it is a self-flattering contradiction that wise men despise the opinions of fools and yet are proud of having their esteem self-love rightly defined is far from being a fault a man that loveth himself right will do everything else right a man who doth not think he is punished when he is blamed is too much hardened to be ever reformed the court of shame hath of late lost much of its jurisdiction it ought by right both to judge in the first instance and to exclude all appeals from it shame is a disease of the last age this seemeth to be cured of it singularity may be good sense at home but it must not go much abroad it is a commendation to be that which a crowd of mistaken fools call singular there can hardly be a severer thing said to a man in this age than that he is like the rest of the world slander would not stick if it had not always something to lay hold of a man who can allow himself the liberty to slander hath the world too much at his mercy but the man that despiseth slander deserveth it speakers in public should take more pains to hold in their invention than to raise it invention is apt to make such sallies that it cannot secure its retreat he that will not make a blot will be pretty sure in his time to give a stroke a patient hearer is a sure speaker men are angry when others do not hear them yet they have more reason to be afraid when they do misspending a man's time is a kind of self-homicide it is making life to be of no use truth is not only stifled by ignorance but concealed out of caution or interest so if it had not a root of immortality it must have been long since extinguished the most useful part of wisdom is for a man to give a good guess what others think of him it is a dangerous thing to guess partially and a melancholy thing to guess right nothing would more contribute to make a man wise than to have always an enemy in his view a wise man may have more enemies than a weak one but he will not so much feel the weight of them indeed the being wise doth either make men our friends or discourage them from being our enemies wisdom is only a comparative quality it will not bear a single definition a man hath too little heat or wit or courage if he hath not sometimes more than he should just enough of a good thing is always too little long life giveth more marks to shoot at and therefore old men are less well thought of 
than those who have not been so long upon the stage other men's memories retain the ill whilst the good things done by an old man easily slip out of them old men have in some degree their reprisals upon younger by making nicer observations upon them by virtue of their experience finis end of miscellaneous thoughts and reflections and end of the complete works of george savile first marquis of halifax read by john greenman